Good morning, and welcome to DapperCon. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Over the next two days, we're going to come together and share our experiences and knowledge about Dapper. Day one will be filled with presentations, panels, and case studies. You will have the opportunity to hear from the founders, maintainers, and adopters of Dapper. The presentations will be led by two guest speakers, Jessica Dean and Cecil Phillip, to help you get started using Dapper and teach you how to run Dapper in production. During the maintainers panel, hear from those that help develop Dapper. You'll get an inside look at how Dapper is released and how you can get involved. We also have an adopter panel where you can ask questions and hear from those that have been using Dapper to accelerate their cloud native development. During the case study sessions, we will take a closer look at applications developed with Dapper and learn how companies are using Dapper today. Every session will have a channel on the Dapper Discord where you can engage with other attendees and the presenters. Day two will provide an opportunity to get hands on with Dapper during a half day workshop led by members of the Dapper community. You can code along in Java, Python, and C Sharp, or watch a live coding session. Now, just sit back, relax, and enjoy DapperCon. Well, welcome to this first DapperCon, and it's fantastic to have all of you join us today. Uh, my name is Mark Fossil, and I'm a Dapper maintainer and a member of the Dapper Steering and Technical Committee. My name is Jerome, and I am a Dapper maintainer and also a member of the Dapper Steering Committee. So today, Jerome and I are going to spend some time discussing why Dapper was created, some of our favorite features and capabilities, what we're seeing in the community with its growth and engagements, and then some of Dapper's future directions. And in this keynote as well, as well as the rest of the conference, we're going to be hearing from several other companies on why they're using Dapper and some of their contributions. Uh, so Dapper was publicly released in October of 2019. So this month, we're celebrating its second anniversary, um, which is why we're super excited about having this DapperCon. And so Yorod and I thought it'd be great to give our perspective on what are the problems first that Dapper is solving for developers building scalable distributed applications. In other words, we thought we'd start off and share what is the why of Dapper? So why don't you kick it off your own? Yeah, thanks, Mark. If you really think about what Dapper is offering developers, it's a set of APIs. And these set of APIs are really targeted at making developers' lives easier when writing distributed application. And you know, I know that oftentimes we talk about Dapper in the context of microservices specifically, but it's also really important for me at least to um, share here that Dapper can really be used from any kind of application, right? So you can use it from a microservice or a monolith. Um, or really from any kind of app. Um, and these set of APIs are meant to make uh, your code portable between environments, so between on-prem environments and different clouds. Um, and it's also meant to make your code uh, reliable and uh, resilient to failures. And these are really the core uh, tenants of all of the Dapper APIs and the capabilities that it offers developers. Um, and so if you look at uh, modern architectures today where you have lots of services communicating um, in an environment which is not oftentimes stable in terms of network or um, reliable connections, Dapper really inject these um, cloud native capabilities like retries and connection res resiliency and mutual TLS um, for service to service calls. And then also gives you components that you can talk to uh, via Dapper um, and Dapper will basically handle all of the hard stuff the developers usually face when writing their services. That also gives them a lot of code portability because you can move your code between clouds and uh, it'll also just work on your local development machine. So that's really the why of Dapper, just to have developers focus on their core logic instead of focusing on infrastructure concerns. Yeah, and in fact, you know, going on to that point, I think the way I like to think about it is that the way that Kubernetes brought a set of consistent APIs to operators. Uh, we think we're doing the same thing with Dapper, where developers, instead of can have a set of consistent APIs for that code portability, um, and that way, you know, that consistency, I think, will be elevate them to be able to build applications that run on many diff different environments. So what about some of the background of, of Dapper? How, how, did it, how did it first start? Yeah, um, so as for how Dapper got started, um, in 2019, my uh, then manager, Hai Shiba, and I were working for Marco Sinovich, CEO of Azure. And we were exploring the concept of an application model that uh, gives developers 
uh, and operators an, an easier way to deploy and tie together a bunch of services that make up an application. Um, and at some point we realized that uh, developers need much more than a deployment model. And we want to research um, and challenges uh, that developers are facing when writing their applications. And that's when we created a proof of concept that uh, gave developers a set of HTTP and JRPC APIs to just make their uh, development easier in uh, platforms like uh, Kubernetes. It was initially called reactive, then renamed to actions. And at that point, uh, Mark Rusinovich created an incubation team and that was really its first major project. Um, then you, Mark, uh, came along from a different team that was exploring the same problem. And together we open source Dapper, um, which is an acronym for distributed application runtime in October 2019. Yeah, that's a great story. And yes, you know, bringing together those two teams, we had both experiences with building these distributed applications, seeing the types of problems that developers are having, using it both internal and external, and we've seen many of these problems. And so we saw that there was a commonality that people wanted to have in terms of building um, these distributed apps and, and something like Dapper was, would neatly fit into making them productive. So why don't we hear from the first of our co uh, co companies? Let's hear now from Mark Rizolovich, who is the Microsoft Azure CTO and has been deeply involved with Dapper from its inception to share his perspective on Dapper and the investments that Microsoft is making. Enterprise developers are being asked to do more than ever. On top of solving their business problem, they need to do it by leveraging cloud services. They need to create scalable, resilient, secure applications. They need to use microservices and containers to do service discovery, to have monitoring and logging. They need to be able to use cloud services. And on top of it all, they're being asked to make applications that are portable between different clouds or on-premises in the cloud. It's all a bit overwhelming. The emergence of programming models like functions as a service and actors show the promise of the platform taking some of the burden away from a developer, providing resiliency built in, providing service discovery built in, but they don't go all the way. What we recognized when we came up with the dapper vision inside of the Azure office, the CTO, was that by leveraging a sidecar pattern, we could offload a lot of the complexity to sidecar code, the dapper, the distributed application runtime, which could address things like providing the mechanisms for functions as a service or actors, but allowing a developer to use whatever language and code they wanted to use and to provide building blocks that would solve common challenges like service discovery for service to service invocations and abstract even classes of cloud services like pub sub and storage so that code wouldn't have to use SDKs where developers wouldn't have to learn each cloud provider's service idiosyncrasies and their code would be portable out of the box. It's two years since that idea and Dapper has now graduated from an incubation into a product team here at Microsoft. It's also got a thriving open source community behind it and many customers now using it in production. We're so proud of what Dapper has become and we're so excited that this community is built up around Dapper to take it to the next level. We're just getting started and thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, Jeroen, let's now talk about the what of Dapper. Uh, Dapper has a set of APIs, APIs that we call building blocks that include things like service to service invocation, publish and subscribe, bindings to interact with external systems, observability. Um, and you know those are the, you know, the APIs that developers can use. But rather than talk about every single one of those APIs, because there's lots to cover inside the wall, let's touch on some of our favorite capabilities, the things that really makes developers' lives easy. So what are some of the things that you, know, you would mention or that have been developed inside Dapper that are some of your favorite things that you would put out as sort of the standout capabilities? Well, that's a difficult question because, you know, we, we released over 100 features, I think, since we released uh, Dapper 0 0.1 um, just, you know, two years ago. Um, so that is a, a pretty difficult question. Um, instead of starting off with what makes, you know, developers' lives easier, I want to talk about maybe features that make developers sleep better at night. And for me personally, that's uh, our introduction of uh, mutual TLS and automatic cert renewal. So when you're writing your application, you ne don't necessarily want to know or deal with the infrastructure 
for securing your applications end-to-end. -end. And with the Dapper Service Invocation Building Block, we introduced end-to-end -end authentication um, based on SPIFI, which is a CNCF standard, um, to basically carry over uh, IDs for different services, which allows them to create access lists um, and, of course, have the data that's passing between services be encrypted in transit. Um, and of course, all of the certificate management is just um, taken away from developers and it's being handled and rotated automatically by Dapper. So yes, it makes your code secure and um, ops people don't need to actually manage the certificates renewal. So I think that's something that um, I'm pretty excited about. And then of course, um, you know, I've been talking to uh, Ryan Nowak, our uh, .NET SDK maintainer for quite some time. And, for months, he's been coming to me saying, you know, your own, our GRPC experience is actually not that good because we require developers um, to let go of their existing GRPC services and adopt our model. And it's not so native to GRPC. And, you know, at, at the time I basically told him, yeah, I, I hear you, but we have other things to, um, to concern ourselves about. And over time, the community was really, really um, insisting that we provide a native GRPC experience. So the next, um, favorite feature of mine, at least, um, is our gRPC proxying experience, which really allows developers to take their code as is and just uh, hook up Dapper into it. All they need to do is just change from their hard-coded DNS address or IP to the Dapper local host, and then you get observability, you know, distributed tracing, um, connection resiliency, and mutual authentication all the way through. And yeah. it works inside of Kubernetes and outside, too. Also, um, state sharing, I think, for me, is a really important feature. Uh, Dapper is also a set of best practices that are given to developers. And in a microservices environment, you don't necessarily want one service to be able to access the data of another service. So by default, Dapper will encapsulate the data for each service. Um, but our friend from Alibaba introduced a really good feature that actually gives developers a choice in deciding how to share state between services. So with that feature, you can encapsulate data for every given service or you can create groups of um, services that share state, or you can just decide that all of your services actually get the same state. And uh, that to me is also a really useful feature. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good set of features. Actually, returning back to the security pieces that you, know, you referred to in the, in the MTLS, and, and I, I think that Dapper is focused greatly on sort of enterprise security. Not only does it allow you to do MTLS between the services themselves, but also I think the actual capability where you can restrict one service talking to another, the access to particular components from a service, and the restriction on what you can publish and subscribe to. And also when you're talking about you know, donations and Alibaba doing their work, I think the secrets API uh, that was also donated from the community early on, it was one of the early contributions that allowed you to abstract out secrets so that they can be held in secret stores, where I think was a, an important piece that allows the, the separation of secrets from your code. Uh, another one actually I would mention was just uh, the console integration um, done by Man Group. And I think that piece of work that allowed console to do DNS resolution, and that really enabled Dapper now to run on you know, hosted environments where there's a set of VMs that's independent of Kubernetes and you can do the DNS resolution. So now you can do it on like your premises or on hybrid environments. I think that was an important piece. You know, with some of the console integration, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's really awesome because first of all, it allowed us to decouple Dapper from the platform it was uh, running on. So, you know, we had a Kubernetes DNS um, and we had mutual, uh, sorry, not mutual. We had um, multicast DNS for running on uh, just any kind of environment, right, in VMs. And when we were running Dapper uh, self-hosted, uh, we would default to MDNS and on Kubernetes, we would default to Kubernetes. So the first thing that uh, that contribution from uh, Man Group did was basically allow us to write pluggable DNS resolution uh, components into Dapper. And then, of course, it allows you to create this flat network um, that can span between different Kubernetes clusters or right. between Kubernetes clusters and on-premise environments too. Um, also, you know, between a uh, developer's local machine and a, a remote Kubernetes cluster in any cloud. So I think that really helps in connecting services in distributed environments. Well, let's now hear from the next company, Alibaba. Uh, Alibaba is part of the Dapper Steering and Technical Committee, and they've made significant contributions to Dapper, including using it in several of their projects internally. So I have with us today Ian Liu uh, from Alibaba to share his perspective of how they see Dapper and how they use it internally.
So Ian. Thanks, Mark. We at Alibaba started adopting Dapper back to one year ago. The most valuable feature Dapper attracts us is just as it declares. Focus on your application's core logic and keep your code simple and portable. We found it fit into our internal function computing platform very well. In my opinion, an ideal function computing platform should be able to provide language options as many as possible. But before Dapper came out, we can only offer one language support, which is, which is Java in our case. And this is because the backend services inside Alibaba usually provide Java-based SDK only. The demand for more languages is strong and has always been there and Dapper came to rescue. Now, Dapper has become the default application runtime in our platform, and on this platform, we are now having applications running in four languages, including Java, Golang, Node, and C++. And we are confident to offer new language support very quickly, even before users ask for it. Of course, in order to achieve this, we did lots of work to integrate the internal infrastructure software into Dapper and contributed back part of our work back to the community when we saw it fit. We use the Dapper in other scenarios as well, but I will not go into details today. Now we are about to explore how Dapper can be helpful in the area of edge computing, and I believe it will become another interesting journey to us. Last, thanks again, Mark, for having chance to share our view on Dapper and how we use it inside Alibaba. We are very glad that Dapper is now being donated to, to CNCF. And since by doing this, we believe more and more people in China will get to know Dapper and start using it. Finally, we also hope more and more engineers can join this community contribute to this project and build a Dapper a success together. Well, thanks Ian. Um, now let's talk about community uh, and the community contributions and engagement that have been made to Dapper is a super important part of its growth. Um, first, let's talk about you know, what we have seen inside the community. As you can see on the slide on the right, that Dapper's community has grown enormously since its first inception. We have close to 15,000 GitHub stars, there's over two and a half thousand members on the Discord channel all actively helping each other. There's over 200,000 page views each month uh, on the Dapper documentation. And all of those have really helped grow the community. But I think the most important part is that ever since the very beginning of Dapper, through all of its preview releases and it, it recently from its stable release, the community has always contributed directly into each one of the releases. And earlier this year, we had a Dapper 1.0 release come out and that was a significant milestone because it showed to the community you know, that Dapper was ready. But we couldn't have done that without the adopters who took on early bets on Dapper, used it in production, used it in test environments, and they helped enormously get Dapper to a stable 1.0 release. So we want to say thank you greatly to all of those early adopters who took a bet on Dapper to enable everyone else to sort of build out and take Dapper into production. And so now we see many customers running in production and in test environments, um, and each of the releases up until the most recent 1.4 release, you know, have included significant features from the community, and we continue to keep this momentum going for the future 1.5 and 1.6 releases going out. So the community is very important. Um, your own, from the community perspective, you know, what would you like to kind of touch on there in terms of where the contributions have been? The contributions have been all over the place. Uh, DAP runtime, our components contrib, our CLI and developer tools, uh, our different SDKs. We've we've seen the community even create new SDKs. Um, the JavaScript SDK is really a good example of that. Also, the PHP SDKs, our beloved maintainers, uh, Xavier and Rob, doing a, an awesome job for these. Uh, for me personally, if I look at Dapper components, which are really the extensible point of Dapper and what provides this um, code, um, portability aspect for Dapper. 
um, is an area that has seen the most contributions, I think. You know, when we released Dapper, we had, what, seven or eight components, and now we have over 80. And um, the greater majority of them have been contributed by the community. And when I say community, I mean not the Dapper maintainers. So that, to me, is amazing. We're seeing a lot of uh, components from, you know, GCP, AWS, Azure, um, and also just general open source components. Um, and that really helps Dapper be um, this portable um, runtime that can take your code anywhere. Yeah, and I think those are super important, including as all the contributions. I think they said there's over 80 components now. Yep. Yeah. So with that, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to let's hear from our next company. Let's hear from Intel. Um, and Intel are also part of the Dapper Steering and Technical Committee, and they're a leader in cloud and server technologies. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Scarpness to share Intel's views on how Dapper is, have contributed to the cloud native space and some of the investments that they're making into the Dapper project. So, Mark. Well, thanks, Mark and Yaron. I lead the system software engineering team at Intel, and we've been following uh, Dapper for a while, and it really appeals to us because it helps developers build complex distributed applications more easily and run them across the cloud and the edge, building them in the language of their choice and with portability, you know, taking on this, this goal of any language, any framework, anywhere, which we think is a great goal to work towards. So we're very excited to join the Dapper Technical Steering Committee and of course, to be an active member of the community. And one of the areas that we've been exploring is bringing hardware acceleration to Dapper. You know, we've been building lots of cool hardware accelerators into our platforms, and we've been looking at how can we bring the value of those accelerators to the developers and users of Dapper. For example, fast and secure communication is of course core to running a distributed microservices-based application. And we've already been making some contributions in this area, and now we're working on bringing support for some of our hardware accelerators that can make this work better, faster, and more securely. For example, we have our Quick Assist technology, or QAT, that provides crypto acceleration and data compression offload. And we've also added crypto acceleration instructions to our latest third generation Intel scalable Xeon processor. So we're working on how can we bring the value of these accelerators and use them inside of Dapper to give the developers and users a better experience. Now, of course, this is really just a start. We're very much looking forward to working with all of you in the Dapper community going forward to continue to deliver on the promise of Dapper and work towards truly achieving the goals. So thanks and look forward to working with all of you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, you're on late. let's look towards the future of where Dapper is going and some of the things that we see on the horizon for the next year. Um, so, you know, what excites you about in terms of the features and capabilities that we're going to build next and some of the project's direction that's going in? Another good question. Um, I think there's three major features that I would call out here. One is the current proposal for the configuration API that we've actually um, just landed on for uh, design and it's going into implementation. So the configuration API um, is extremely important because it will allow developers to just uh, consume configuration from their apps, uh, no matter where their code's running, and uh, hook up into all of these different configuration providers and also be notified whenever a configuration item changes. So that's just another really useful API that we're gonna surface up to developers. Uh, the second one, I think, is the distributed uh, logs API. Um, currently uh, driven also by the uh, larger community. And this is going to allow for things like very easy leader elections um, types of applications. So if you have a bunch of services, um, you'll very easily uh, be able to tell which one is the elected leader and basically just grab a lock. Um, and that will be supported on Kubernetes, on-prem, and really in any type of environment. So that's going to unlock a bunch of uh, stateful scenarios for Dapper, which I think is also really important. Um, and then something that we've heard a lot from the community is about how the uh, key value um, API model of Dapper is kind of limited in that you can't query state. And developers have been very vocal about that pretty much since the beginning of Dapper. And I'm really happy to see that we've made good progress in designing for 
um, two sets of APIs. One of them is a query API, where developers will be able to query, state that they saved using the Dapper state APIs. And then we're also uh, targeting a more general purpose database API, which will allow Dapper to offer this um, SQL-like abstraction, if you will, um, for any type of data that's saved in any type of database. So again, I hope that these features will just make Dapper a lot more usable for stateful applications. Yeah, those are some pretty good insights. Um, and I, I think all of those new APIs, you know, will expand you know, Dapper's capabilities enormously. Let, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the future direction of the project. So one of the most frequent questions we get asked is, you know, where is Dapper going in terms of donation to foundations? Um, and how's the project kind of growing? It's sort of in the broader uh, industry and the ecosystem. And so early this year, actually, we donated Dapper into the CNCF back in March and we donated it to be contributed as an incubation project to CNCF. And it's slowly been working its way through the process there. And you know, we're at the stage now where it's getting close to public open comments around these things. So we're super excited that you know, Dapper is going to go, hopefully be accepted soon into CNCF and have you know, the support around that. And you see the growth within inside that. So uh, what are some of your perspectives and your thoughts on the, the CNCF work, Euron? Yeah, of course, the CNCF donation is extremely important um, for Dapper just, you know, to gain these new audiences and, and have a more um, diverse uh, outset of maintainers um, joining the project and, of course, contributors from uh, other projects contributing to Dapper. So that's going to be uh, really useful for, for Dapper in that sense. But I also want to talk about our commitment to open governance. And uh, we've announced a uh, open governance steering committee um, even before we uh, donated Dapper to the CNCF. And what we mean by that is that we are really trying to make the project vendor neutral and encourage participation from multiple companies and vendors to really ensure that Dapper solves for everyone's concerns. Um, and then you know, recently we announced the uh, Dapper steering committee on which both you and I sit along with our friends from Alibaba and Intel. And to me, that's just uh, a really good sign um, for our commitment, Dapper project's commitment to vendor neutrality. Yes, and you know, and to conclude on on some of the the direction of that project, I think those steering committees is extremely important to kind of help the you know the inclusiveness around these things. But I also thought it was very insightful um, in some of the review of the Dapper donation, talking about Dapper and the API standardization. Okay, you know, give us some of your insights into you know Dapper as, as an API uh, and and some of the the way that the CNCF were looking at that. Yeah, so you know, as the project moves forward, actually. I'm looking forward to separating the APIs from the implementation and really making the Dapper APIs the center of focus going forward. So you can think about um, maybe even different implementations of those APIs. And once we separate those out, we'll be able to um, improve these um, and even provide you know, alpha implementations or other types of um, implementations that don't necessarily um, find their way into the, the, the core Dapper project today. Um, and that's going to allow for uh, multiple platforms to maybe adopt the APIs and have their own implementations, which I think is going to help developers adopt Dapper in a much more natural way in uh, other environments. Yeah. Well, it's been fantastic having a chance for both your own and I to share our perspectives and insights with you today in this keynote. Uh, we're super excited about being able to uh, speak to you today. Uh, we want to thank all the speakers from Microsoft, Alibaba and Intel for giving us their insights to see where they think Dapper is going. Um, and for all of you who've been involved and contributed to the project in the Dapper community, thank you very much. And if you haven't yet, we deeply encourage you to get involved, give us your perspectives, um, and you can see some way of contact, contacting us you know, through the links on this slide. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Please attend the rest of the sessions on YouTube. We've got a lot of great content, a lot of great speakers for you to spend the rest of the day learning. And we wanna thank you for your time. Hi everyone, thank you so much for making the time to join me for this session. I'm really honored to be able to be speaking to you all today at the first day of DapperCon 2021. Now, my name is Cecil Phillip and I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. But what's more important is that I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of how Dapper can make microservice development so much easier. Now, if you recall from the previous session, you saw Mark speaking with a few customers and they were talking about how Dapper can give them the flexibility that they need to be able to solve some of the concerns they have inside of their infrastructure. 
Well, in this particular session, I want to take a little bit of a step back. And instead, we're going to focus on what that hello world getting started experience feels like inside of Dapper. So I want to show you how to get the Dapper tools and the CLI installed on your machine. We're going to see how you could quickly Dapperize an application that you probably already have on your hard drive right now. Then we'll explore some of the different building blocks that are available out of the box with Dapper. And then also, I want to show you how you can combine tools like Docker Compose and Visual Studio Code to create a really interesting local development experience as you're diving into the world of Dapper. So hopefully that sounds fun because, well, that's what we're going to do. So as folks are starting to explore this world of distributed systems, one of the things that you get to eventually run to is something that I like to call the microservice matrix. And if you've ever heard that from anyone else before, just know that they got it from me, okay? But inside of the world of distributed systems and microservices, there's just so many options for tools that will help you achieve anything that you want to do inside of your application. So if you think about it, if I wanted to do something like service discovery, for example, I might have multiple instances of multiple services, and I need to know what services are available, where are they, what's their health status, what path do I need to take to get there? And there's so many options, like I mentioned, for you to be able to solve that particular problem. You might also have the concern of doing you know, key value stores and state storage for your different components. Right? We have tons of options for that as well. Some other things you might want to do include public subscribe, maybe I want to do secrets management, centralized configuration, observability, there's tons of things. Right? And each of them have a ton of different options for folks to choose from. Now, the problem with having so many different options is that, well, now we have to take the time to really understand which one of these options are going to work best for us. And you know, as you, know, you have more things that you want to do, that matrix is going to become a lot more complicated. We're going to need to figure out how these components can play together. But also, we're going to need to figure out, well, do they support the operating systems that we're building and deploying on? Do they support the programming languages and the runtimes we want to work with? Do they have SDKs and APIs that we could use to integrate more deeply into our app? What about later on if we decide, hey, well, I don't want to use this anymore, and I want to swap it out for something else? Well, how easy is it going to be for me to do that? Like, how much technical debt am I going to have to dig through to be able to switch out this component? And is that work even worth it at the end of the day? So for me, this is where Dapper really shines. Dapper provides a portable, lightweight, event-driven runtime that abstracts some of those common use cases, some of those common tasks that a lot of microservice developers you know, have to go through today. But for me, the main thing that Dapper gives me is the ability to focus. Right? I get the time to focus on the things that really matter. I bring value to the business. And, that, and you know, in my case, it's usually around creating features and functionality and solving issues that our customers really care about and not necessarily spending the time to worry about the infrastructure. So as the team for Dapper went down this path to kind of achieve some of these goals, what it ended up doing was creating a programming language agnostic, host agnostic runtime that almost anyone can play in. So regardless of whatever your development environment looks like, you should be able to plug into Dapper and use the tools that you're familiar with in the environment that you're familiar with as well. Now, another thing to know about Dapper is that it is also open source and it's very extensible. So if for whatever reason there's a component or there's a feature that's missing, then you could very easily contribute that back to the core product and now we'll all be the better for it, which I think is amazing. Now, if you recall, I mentioned that Dapper provides us a set of abstractions. And the way it you know, shows us or provides us these abstractions is through a concept called building blocks. And each building block provides a particular task or particular set of functionality that microservice developers might want to use. So if you take a look at the slide, you can see here that we have building blocks that represent things like service-to-service -service invocation or service discovery. We have state management, public subscribe when we want to publish messages to a topic, there's even triggers and bindings for that reactive style programming model if you're interested in that. There's actors, observability, application secrets, and tons more. But one of the important things that I want you to recognize here is that all of these abstractions are exposed to you via HTTP and gRPC. So that means that as long as the programming languages that you use support any of these types of protocols, then you'll be able to plug into the world of DAPA without any concerns at all. Another thing that I think is really important to point out even though Dapper has all these different building blocks, this is not an all or nothing type of approach. You can pick and choose the different components and building blocks based on whatever makes sense. So that means that I could choose 
you know, to use just the service discovery or the state management building block and not the rest. Or maybe I want to use all of them, or maybe I don't want to use any of them at all, right? The choice is completely up to you. Again, Dapper gives you the choice to use the things that make sense for the application that you're building. Now, the reason I keep repeating this is because I think it, it's, it's really interesting for all types of applications and not just distributed microservice type applications as well. So if you think about things like legacy apps, maybe I have an older application that we might want to start modernizing. Well, Dapper could be the path that helps plug these two worlds together. So as I'm continuing on one side to develop these very lightweight and efficient services, my legacy application can still plug into that world and all it has to do is go through Dapper. Now, why don't we take a moment and dive into our first demo and I can show you exactly what it takes to get started using Dapper. Now, before we really start diving into Dapper, the first thing I want to do is show you this web API that's been built with Python and Fast API. As you can see here, there's really not too much happening inside of this API. But I do want to show you what it looks like before we start dapperizing. Now, I'm going to start running this in a command line. And what I'm going to do is start executing some requests against this API. Now, I'm going to use the Rust client extension for Visual Studio Code. But if you feel like, you could use anything like curl or whatever other client that makes you comfortable. Now, I'm going to set my host to localhost 8000. I'm going to execute the requests. And as you can see here, status OK, right? Everything looks great. If I come down here and I execute this next method, I'm going to change this query string. I'm going to say, hello, DapperCon. And we can see that everything looks just fine. So let's go ahead and stop this. And now what I want to do is add a little bit of Dapper. Now, if I come back to my command line, notice if I type Dapper, it says command not found. So I don't have the Dapper CLI or any of the tools currently installed on my machine. I think the next thing that we should do now is just to head over to the documentation. Because I believe every great open source project begins with great documentation. Now I'm going to click on that Get It Started link. I'll head over to Install Dapper CLI. And here you'll see the different instructions based on the operating system that you're using. Now I'm using Mac OS, so I'm going to look for the instructions for Homebrew. And I'm going to copy those, because Homebrew is what I prefer to use when I install stuff. Now if I head back over to Visual Studio Code, I can paste that command I just copied and hit Enter. And what Homebrew is going to do is go ahead and pull down that latest version of the Dapper CLI and add it to the path on my terminal. So now, if I type Dapper, I should be able to see all the various commands that I can execute. And I can see that really cool ASCII art, so you know we're in business. The next thing I need to do before I actually start running Dapper is I need to initialize it on my system. So I'm going to type in Dapper init on the command line. Now what Dapper is going to do is pull down some default components and set up some configuration that we can start using. If you take a look at the output inside of the terminal, you can see that Dapper pulled down the Dapper D binary, a placement container, a Redis container, and also a Zipkin container. And these have already been configured and are ready for us to use. Now let's go ahead and Dapperize our Python application. One of the available commands for me to use is the Dapper run command. So let's see how we could use that to Dapperize this Python application. Now if I type Dapper run, now if I'm going to run my application with Dapper, I need to give it an ID. So this is what we're going to refer to this application or the service as. So I'm just going to call that API. I'm going to let Dapper know the port that it's running at. So if you recall, this application runs on port 8000. And the last thing that I need to do is I also have to specify the port that Dapper is going to run at. So Dapper has its own HTTP port. And by default, I like to set that to 3500. Now, I have to tell Dapper the application I want it to run. And if you recall, that's my Python main application. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And now you're going to see a lot of stuff being spit out to the console. There's a few things I want you to recognize here. One, Dapper has discovered our application running on port 8000. So that means it now knows how to get to it. Also, if we start to scroll up a little bit in the logs, you could see that metrics has been enabled. Tracing has also been enabled. And also, if I go up a little bit more, it's loaded some of those components that we spoke about earlier. So here you see it's configured the Redis component for both PubSub and also for state storage. So now that that's running, let's get a little bit of space. And let's open up this HTTP uh, request file again. Now I'm going to change this port. And instead of us running on port 8000, I'm going to run on 3500, which is the Dapper port. I'm going to send my requests. And notice my body comes back and my status is still OK. But one thing is a little bit different. 
And you'll now notice that we have that trace parent HTTP header, and that's been included by Dapper to enable some of those distributed tracing scenarios that it provides for us. Let's see what happens when we hit the next request. Notice that works just fine as well. So with changing no code in my application, we've just dapperized it and enabled a lot of really interesting features. I'll we'll see how we can really make use of them as we go on in the session. Now, before we move on, there's one more feature I definitely want to show you because I think this is really cool. I want to show you the Dapper dashboard. Now, this dashboard by default is going to run on port 8000. And if I open it up on localhost, you'll see it shows me all of the different Dapper applications that I have running. In our case, it's only our Flask API for now. If I click on this section for components, the dashboard will show me all of the components that have been configured for my Dapper application. So right now we have a pub sub and we also have a state store. I can go a little bit further and even click on some of these components to get a little bit more information about how they've been configured, how long they've been running for. I can even see that default YAML file that created them. So if you want to quickly inspect what's going on inside of your Dapper apps, definitely check out the Dashboard dashboard and it's included by default with the Dapper CLI. Now let's continue moving forward and take a look at some of the components and building blocks that are available for us inside of Dapper. Now that we have Dapper installed and ready to go on our machines, why don't we take a little bit of a deeper step to get a better understanding of how some of it works. Now Dapper operates in what's called a sidecar model. So that means that for every instance of every service that makes up our solution, we're going to have an associated instance of that Dapper sidecar process. So here you see I have my app. If I had 10 instances of that, I'd have 10 instances of that Dapper sidecar process running next to them, usually on localhost. And now once the instance of my application and also the sidecar are up and running, they can start communicating with each other over those gRPC or HTTP APIs that we mentioned earlier. But my application doesn't really need to be concerned about anything else outside of that environment. Right now, if it needs to get PubSub, if it needs to do state storage, secrets management, or if it even needs to invoke a service on another instance of another service somewhere else within my infrastructure, the only thing it needs to do is to communicate through Dapper. And no, those Dapper sidecars are going to be self-aware, right? They're going to find each other and they're going to be able to know well, who's going to be responsible for dealing with this request. So here as, a, as an example, you can see that we're going to make a request over to the cart service and we're going to invoke the method new order. And notice how it's using that very standard HTTP type contract. The same thing that could be said for using state storage, right? I'm going to make an HTTP request over to state and I want to get the inventory state storage and I want to retrieve the item 67. Here's an example how you can do publish subscribe, right? Like I can create an HTTP payload using my HTTP client of choice based on the programming language I'm using. And I can send that over to this endpoint to publish a message on the orders topic. And here now also you can see an example of how you can get secrets out of a secret store. So maybe I want to store passwords or API keys or things of that nature. Now at this point you might be wondering, well, okay, I see Dapper can give us these abstractions, but what about the concrete implementations that's implementing these abstractions? And well, that's where Dapper components come into play. And if you remember, as I said earlier, Dapper is very extensible. So for every building block in here, we have tons of different options for concrete implementations for each of those building blocks. So you can see for the state store, we support a variety of different databases like Cosmos DB and Redis and Cassandra. For publish subscribe and pub sub brokers, we have support for service bus, you know, Redis, RabbitMQ. Again, and the list goes on, right? For every Dapper component, there's tons of different options for things that you could make use of. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Dapper is open source. So a lot of the components that Dapper supports today were actually contributed by the community. If you head over to the Dapper organization on GitHub and you go to the components-contrib repo, you'll be able to see tons of different components that you can make use of inside of your applications. Now, I think it's time we dive into another demo and see a more concrete example of how we could start making use of some of these Dapper components inside of a more real world application. This next demo I want to show you is just a little bit more involved, but I like showing it off because it has a lot of different Dapper components working together to create a complete solution. Now, Contoso Crafts is a storefront that has a list of products that you could choose from. And if you want to, you can click on the info button and get more information about a particular item or you can even go to the different items that you want and you can add them to the cart. So as you notice here, I can click add to cart. As I'm doing that, that increment button here at the top right side keeps going up. If I click on that shopping cart icon, you'll notice here are all the items that I added to the cart. And then when I hit submit, 
hopefully at some point, someone's going to be able to get my order, process it, and those items will get shipped to my house. Now, even though this looks like a simple application, this is actually made up of three different microservices working together through Dapper. The first service is actually the web UI. And this is built with ASP.NET Core Blazor. And its job is really just to display the interface that you're seeing right now. The next one is actually the products API. And that's responsible for giving us all this product information that we're seeing. So everything from where the pictures are, the description, the votes, and even the name of what the product is. And then the last one is the checkout service. And its job is just to listen in the background as new orders are being published to a queue, and it'll process those orders accordingly. Now let's head over to Visual Studio Code and see what this looks like. Inside of the Demo2 folder, I'm gonna open the source directory. And here you can see I have three separate projects. And like I mentioned, one is the website project, the products API project, and also the checkout processor project. Now, if you're familiar with .NET, you know we have this concept of a csproj file. And the csproj file is where we list all the dependencies for what we need inside of our applications, like different packages we're gonna use and things of that nature. So as you can see here, my products API is making use of MongoDB because that's where a lot of that information is being stored from. The last one I'm gonna show you here is the checkout processor. Now, the thing that I want you to notice that's common between all of these different csproj files is that there's absolutely no reference to Dapper. So then your question might be, well, how exactly does Dapper get plugged into this application so that these services can talk to each other? Well, that's what I'm gonna show you right now. Now to get all of these services running at the same time inside of my application, I'm actually making use of Docker Compose. And not only is it running my Dapper components and my application, but it's also running the infrastructure pieces. So that includes things like MongoDB, Redis, RabnMQ, and some other really interesting things. Now let's take a look at the Docker Compose Dapper file. Now if you recall, earlier when we were showing the slides, I mentioned that Dapper runs using what's called a sidecar model. So that means for every instance of your application, you're going to have an instance of the Dapper process running right next to it, preferably on localhost. So here, inside of my Docker Compose file, you can see that I'm specifying some options for that main website service, but also right next to it, I'm also specifying the Dapper sidecar that's going to be attached to it as well. If you look at line 25 through line 35, you'll see I have a command where I'm executing that Dapper D binary. And just like we did with the Dapper CLI, I'm passing in an app ID, an app port, but I'm also passing in some additional information so you can know about the components that I want it to configure for me. As we continue scrolling down inside of this Docker Compose file, you'll see that I have a products API. And just like the website, I have some options here that tell Docker Compose how to build my application into a container. But more importantly, right next to it, I have a products API Dapper sidecar, which has options that are very similar to that website Dapper sidecar that we saw before. As we scroll even further down, you probably guessed it, there's a checkout processor and there's also a checkout processor sidecar. Always try to remember, for every instance of your application, you're gonna have an instance of the Dapper sidecar. And your application is gonna be communicating with that sidecar to get access to all of those different components and building blocks that we have configured. Let's head over to the web application and see exactly how some of this communication happens. Now, inside of the startup.cs file, you can see here on line 23, I'm configuring an HTTP client to use localhost 3500. Now, this is the address that I'm going to expect that Dapper sidecar process to be running on. So whenever I make a request for some services, that's the endpoint that I'm going to use. Next, let's open the services folder inside of that same project. And you'll see that I have a file called Dapper product service.cs. Inside of this class, I have a method called get products on line 30. I'm going to make use of that Dapper HTTP client that we just configured. So I create a new HTTP request message. I give it the path. I add the Dapper app ID as a header, and now I go ahead and make my request. Now once my sidecar process gets that request, it's gonna forward it along to that products API. It's gonna process that request, get those results back from MongoDB, and bring it back to me. But my web front end knows nothing about where that product API lives. And this pattern's gonna be the same for the state store, PubSub, and a lot of the other components that we use inside of Dapper. Speaking of other components, let's take a look and see how some of the other ones work. I'm going to open up this components folder and I'm going to look for the product list base. Now inside of here, I should have a method that shows me how to actually add something to the cart. 
And on line 49, you can see I have that add to cart method that takes the product ID and the title of the thing that I want to add to the cart. Now, similarly to how you saw us interact with service invocation, I'm going to use the Dapper API endpoint that's specific to working with state stores. So you can see here, I'm going to specify v1.0 slash state. I'm going to give it the name of the state store and the state that I want to retrieve. So in this case, I want to retrieve the cart state. Then I'm going to make sure if my cart is empty or not, I'm going to add items to the cart. And then when I'm done doing whatever business logic I need to execute, at the end, on line 87 and 88, I'm going to make another request using that same endpoint, but this time I'm going to be doing a post request so I could save the state versus retrieving it. Last but not least, let's take a look at our checkout. Now, this could be found under the components folder in the checkout model. Now, I'm just going to scroll down here a little bit to where the code is. And inside of our submit checkout model, again, you're going to see the similar pattern. I'm going to use that dapper HTTP client, but if you head down to line 75, we're going to serialize that shopping cart content that we want to have published. Then we're going to make a post request over to v1.0 slash publish slash the name of the pub sub. And then checkout is the name of the topic that we want to publish to. Let's take a look over the checkout processor and see exactly how it does this. Now, inside of the checkout processor project, I have a controllers folder. And that controllers folder has this class called dapper controller. So if we take a look through what's going on here, you can see I have two methods. One is a subscribe method, and another one is that slash checkout method. What's important here to know is whenever our application stands up and that dapper sidecar discovers it, the sidecar is going to make a call to our app at the endpoint slash dapper slash subscribe. And that's pretty much how it's going to check to see if our application is interested in listening to any topics. In this case, you can see that I want to listen to the topic called checkout. And then any messages that come in from that topic, I want you to pass it to the checkout route. Now, if we scroll down a little bit, that checkout route is assigned to that checkout order method. So once a message arrives, I'm going to deserialize that information that comes back in. And then I'm just going to write out a simple log to say that the order was received. One thing you might notice here that's really special is that that message is being retrieved from the request using cloud events. And cloud events is just the format that Dapper uses by default as it's sending PubSub messages back and forth. Now, really diving into cloud events is a little bit past what we're going to be doing in this session, but I definitely recommend you check it out if you're interested in the standards compliant way of sending and receiving messages through any message broker. Okay, now we've seen how our application code works. How exactly do we configure Dapper? Well, actually, if you recall, let's head back over to our Dapper Docker Compose file. And if I was supposed to open one of these sidecars, remember, every time we invoke Dapper D, and we're going to pass it a config switch to config that YAML file and also the path to a components folder that has the configuration for all of the components that we want to have used inside of our Dapper applications. Well, that components folder actually exists right here inside of our project. So if I'm supposed to open it up, you can see that I have that config file and I also have this folder that has a few components configured. Now, if I click on this config.yaml file, you can see that this has some basic configuration for how we can set up tracing using Zipkin. And I'll show you that a little bit later as we go on. Let's open up this local folder. Now, inside this folder, I have a few different components that are already set up for us. Now, now if I click on the RabbitMQ pubsub.yaml file, you can see exactly how this component is being configured to be used inside of the pubsub building block inside of Dapper. Looking at this configuration, you can see that we have to specify things like the type of component that this is, the connection information, and then some other options that are very specific to RabbitMQ. Let's take a look at the state store. For state storage, we're actually using Redis. And as you can imagine, it's following a similar format. We have to specify the type. In this case, it's state.redis. And then in the metadata, I have to provide some connection information of how exactly we're going to be able to connect to this instance of Redis. One of the things that you'll notice is a little bit different here is I have the host and port of my Redis service, but I don't have the password that I need to log into it. Instead, I'm making use of something called a secret key reference. And if you remember from the previous slides, secrets are just another building block that we could use inside of Dapper. Not only we could use them inside of our applications, but we could actually use them inside of our configuration files as well. And you can see that we're specifying what secret store we're using on line 16 inside of this file. Now you might be asking, how do I configure secrets? Well, there's a YAML file for that. And inside of that same folder, I'm actually using local secrets. 
Now, I wouldn't recommend that you use local secrets for production, but it's good for development. Local secrets just keep your files inside of a JSON file on your machine where you could use it as a key value store. So it's definitely not the most secure option. But if you stick around for the rest of DapperCon, my teammate Jessica Dean has a really awesome session that's going to show you how you could production harden some of your Dapper configurations. Let's head back to our web browser really quickly and see how Dapper uses some of these components. So if I head over to Zipkin, and I have this one exposed on port 9411, I can click on Dependencies. I can hit the Search button. And now I get this really interesting trace about the different services that are inside of my architecture and also what's communicating with what. So if you look here, you notice that the website is communicating a lot with the product API, but it's also communicating with the checkout processor, just not as often. If you wanted to search for any traces or spans, you could easily do so and set out a find a trace section inside of Zipkin. All you have to do is enter your query and then go ahead and execute it. Now let's head back over to Visual Studio Code. The last bit I want to show you is how you could quickly debug these applications inside of Visual Studio Code. If you open up the .vs code folder, you'll notice that there are launch-settings.json and tasks.json. And inside of these have configurations that allow you to debug into a container. So why don't we go ahead and do that? So let's go and set a breakpoint right here inside of our checkout order. And now I'm going to hit the run and debug section. And notice I'm going to select the Docker checkout processor attached, right? So I want to attach to that running container inside of my Docker Compose group. So I'm going to select the Composer group. And now I have to select what container I want. So here I'm going to select the checkout processor. Notice at the bottom now it's asking, attaching to container requires the .NET Core debugger in the container. Do you want to copy it? Sure. Why not? YOLO. Now the debugger should be successfully attached. Let's head back to the browser really quickly. Go back to our project. I'm going to submit a checkout really quickly. And in a few seconds, three, oh, there we go. Notice that I've hit the breakpoint and I have full debugging capability right here inside of Visual Studio. So notice I have my local variables. I have the debug console available to me. I could step through, step over and inspect values inside of the editor. Now let's head back over to the slides. Now, before you say anything, I know, I get it, that was a lot. We covered so many different topics and concepts in such a short period of time in that last demo, but my goal there was to show you how amazing Dapper could be for microservice development. By just adding a few lines and a few files of YAML configuration, you could see how we enable tracing and metrics and PubSub and tons of these other building blocks that we could use. Also, I think being able to spin up that entire environment locally and then debug into a running container using Docker Compose and Visual Studio Code is really cool. So definitely had to show you that. Now, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Dapper, and I hope that you are, uh, definitely recommend that you head over to dapper.io. Make sure you check out the documentation and go through the Get In Started Guide to see what it actually feels like to get, you know, get into Dapper. We also have communities across a lot of different platforms. So if you're into Discord, make sure you check out our Discord channel where a lot of folks are sharing tips and tricks and projects and blog posts and all the cool things that they're building and doing with Dapper. There's a YouTube channel where there's regularly scheduled community calls with the team that to give you updates about what's going on with the future of the project. Also, the team is on GitHub. Dapper is open source, so you can see all of the different components. You can see all the check-ins. You could read the code. You can contribute and submit issues. So I think that's a really great place for you to get plugged into what's happening. And if you're a .NET developer like I am, I definitely recommend that you check out the Dapper for .NET ebook. This is a freely available ebook. You don't have to put in your email address to download it. You can even read it online if you wanted to. But I think this is a great way for you to get started with Dapper. And even if you're not a .NET developer, it gives you a really good overview about how you could start putting applications together using Dapper. Now, I hope this session has been great for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Please enjoy the rest of DapperCon. I wish I could be there with you all in person, but until we are again, please take care and I'll see you all soon.
Hi everyone, uh, hoping you're having a great DapperCon so far. My name is Ori Zohar, I'm a Dapper Docs maintainer, and I'll be moderating today's uh, Dapper maintainer panel. So we have some of uh, Dapper's maintainers, we don't have all of them because there's quite a few. So I'll have them join me right now so we can meet them. Yeah, here they are. So um, welcome everybody. Again, we only took a selected few. Um, and this is really a chance for the community and all of you tuning in to meet some of the of the maintainers we got at Dapper. So let's go around and kind of hear from each one of you uh, what you're maintaining, how you came into the into the project. Start with you, Yaron. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Yaron. I'm a, a co-founder of the project. I maintain the uh, core Dapper runtime, the Go SDK, the CLI, and the components contrib repositories. Awesome, Xavier. Hi, I'm Xavier. Uh, I'm maintaining JavaScript as DK and became a maintainer uh, almost a year ago. Great. Rob? Yeah, I'm Rob Landers, and I maintain the PHP SDK. It started about a year ago. Great. And Arthur? Hi, uh, my name is Arthur. I'm a maintainer of the Java SDK on the runtime of Components Contrib. And it started uh, a little bit after uh, Yarn. Great. Uh, as I said, I'm Ori. Um, I'm a maintainer in the docs, uh, also quick start samples, uh, and I maintain the blog as well. Um, I joined around version 0 0.5, so that was, yeah, a year and a half ago, I think. Um, great. So let's get into it. So, you know, Dapper is an open source project, and uh, we got a bunch of maintainers here, but we have some other roles in the community. Your own, you're a steering uh, committee member, you're one of the co-founders of Dapper. Can you run us through what kind of roles we have in the community, how people are coming together to work on Dapper? Yeah, sure. So there are several uh, roles in the community. I think you know the first very basic role is just the role of contributor. You come in, you open up an issue, you engage in a discussion, you ask a question on Discord, bam, you're a contributor because you're contributing to the project. People think that you know it's just code that makes you a contributor. It's not. By answering other people's questions, by engaging with the community, you contribute to the project, whatever it is. That's why it's called, you know, a contributor. And that's why it's, you know, capturing such a high level uh, and like so many, so many different things that you can do for the project. It's not just code. It's not just, you know, becoming, you know, a maintainer. It's, it's literally everything that has to do with engaging the broader community. Um, and then the next step beyond that, you know, after you've contributed a lot to the project, you know, um, done, you know, maybe like reviews on your own time, engaged with maintainers, maybe done, you know, a few PRs, and you like get to start to have a really good grasp of the technical subject in Dapper in one of the repositories. And then the next step is that of an approver, meaning you have the technical proficiency to be able to review code and then approve it, and then basically signal to the maintainers of the repository that, yeah, this code is actually okay to go um, and, and to be merged. Uh, and that's a, a pretty good uh, position to uh, make yourself available for the next role, which is maintainer, uh, where maintainer is basically uh, the, the, the top um, role that you can have because it means you are responsible for the technical direction of the repository that you're maintaining. Uh, you basically make the technical decisions and you get to work with the community and making others uh, go from being contributors to being approvers and then onboarding them to become maintainers. That's um, a really important role. But then again, even just, you know, the the role of contributor where you just come in and, and talk to someone, that's immensely important too. And every maintainer basically started off with that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point actually about um, what a contributor is. And I saw a lot of the other panelists nodding because the way we're looking at it and the way we're actually measuring even contribution in the Dapper project is looking at the GitHub statistics for everybody, not just uh, pushing in code, but also opening issues, commenting on proposals and issues. We feel all of that makes Dapper a better project and a more, and we have a more engaged community. So absolutely. So you said we got um, um, approvers and maintainers and, and well, we start with members and then we kind of go through them. And we actually have a few of the panelists who, who became maintainers uh, in that fashion. Rob, you came into uh, to Dapper uh, from a contribution, really. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Uh, sure. So it was Thanksgiving weekend last year. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was one, uh, like I have a system that basically maintains our money and it uh, it runs PHP and C Sharp. And I was looking at maybe rewriting everything in C Sharp um, to run it in Orleans for the actor runtime. And that's when I discovered Dapper and I discovered how it worked. And then I really started digging into it. And I was like, you know what? I can do this and make it run in PHP as well. And then thus the PHP SDK was born. Uh, that's awesome. So a whole SDK contributed uh, by somebody who had a need and now it's actually available to everybody, uh, which mm -hmm. is the best kind of contribution uh, that we get. And Xavier, you had a similar journey, right? Uh, yeah, actually, it's, it's even a bit longer. Um, I've been following Dapper for quite a while. I think it was Dapper 0 0.4 when I, when I started with it. I started off with Python uh, because I wanted to run some reinforcement learning on top of it. Uh, contributed some issues back to, to the repository, to the community there. Um, and then I started working on my own projects. And I saw like my, my to go to language is actually JavaScript and TypeScript. Uh, and I saw there was no really a JavaScript TypeScript uh, library out there for Dapper that allowed me to interact over HTTP. Um, so I, I worked on creating the, the HTTP library and contributed that as well. That's great. Yeah, that's a, a more recent one. And, and definitely a lot of JavaScript users out there that are uh, going to have a much better experience with the SDK. Uh, so that's terrific. I want to jump in now to something that I think would be very interesting to a lot of the people who are using Dapper today and seeing all this cadence of releases. And as Mark and your own said in the keynote, we've had a pretty cool, pretty good constant cadence. Uh, we launched version 1.0 in February of this year, and we're at version 1.4 right now and moving towards 1.5 soon. Um, Archer, I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit more of an insight of behind, under the hood, how does the release process happen? How do the maintainers come together and put together a release? Oh, that's 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 a really good question. So um, first of all, uh, we have a cadence, right? So, um, and we wanna make sure that the SDKs also follow the cadence. Um, so you're gonna see every other month a release of Dapper. And there's a code freeze date where we basically create the release branch out of master. And the release branch is very important because it's out of the major and minor version of Dapper. And that's going to allow us to guarantee uh, hot fixes of previous releases as well. So we just don't release just master. We actually keep release branches uh, uh, for every release we've ever done. Um, and we will make sure we run each retests on AKS and on kind. Uh, and we are working on a way to create, uh, to run each retest in a, on other clouds as well. So that's that going to say that the overall Dapper features are working. Uh, for components, we have conformance tests that make sure that the components that are in GA and some other components as well that, that are opt in for the conformance test are conforming to the Dapper API. Um, so these are another set of tests that run your components from trip. Um, and then we also have performance tests for some features that are important in that, that we think it's important enough to have a performance test at this point, especially service invocation, uh, where we look at to see if there's any uh, deviation of performance uh, from the last uh, release. Um, we also have long haul tests, uh, which is a, t a test environment that we have locally that simulate a real production uh, application with multiple components and uh, uh, we deploy the release candidates and we observe metrics to see if there is any change in CPU utilization, memory utilization, or latency. Um, so this with, um, in, in addition to that, I was about to forget, we also have automation for quick starts and examples, not only in the runtime, but also in SDKs. It means that uh, all the stats that you see in the, in the, in the readme file, they say, do this command, and then look at this output. Look at this command, then look at this output. All the, uh, many of those, I would say the majority of those is now automated. Um, and thanks for, there was actually, there's also another project in our repo that we have to, uh, uh, Charlie actually created to be able to support this side of automation. Uh, so with all of that, we validate the release candidates. And then we cut multiple RCs as we see fine, fine regressions. We keep cutting more and more RCs. Um, and then once we reach a version that we, 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 we believe it's stable enough, 
Uh, then we cut the, re the release by tagging uh, using GitHub tag. And then the automation on GitHub uh, our workflow takes care of the release. Um, and the SDKs work very, very, uh, in a very similar fashion, um, uh, but with their own little differences because each language has its own way of doing things. But um, that's a high level of what we do. And we have caught uh, uh, issues uh, with these tasks. So it's, it is uh, something that has been proven uh, valuable uh, to us. So we are not afraid of cutting more RCs. We want to code as much release candidates as we can, uh, as we catch bugs as the test progresses. Uh, and we also have a set of manual tests uh, that you can see in the release issue. If you look at any previous release, there's an issue that we track all validation steps, and some of those are still manual. Uh, so you can take a look at those as well. Great, Archer. So it sounds like we have um, a lot of testing, uh, some long haul tests, some integration tests. We're cutting RCs. Um, that's great. Um, before I, I move forward, I want to remind people, if you have questions for the panel, we want to get to them. Please drop them in the chat on YouTube, um, and we'll try to get to them if we have time. Um, so you said all that stuff is available on GitHub, too. So if I'm looking uh, to see what's going on uh, and it's a release process, I can actually see the, the like a big checklist of, of what's going on. Your own, can you tell us a little bit maybe about that? specific kind of time uh, between as we're approaching towards a release. I know there's a release team that comes together. Yeah. And uh, I think this is sometimes referred to as the end game. Um, mm -hmm. It has several stages. Can you walk us a little bit more about what's going on and how all this thing that Archer just mentioned kind of come together? Yeah, so at the beginning of a release, we triage issues, right? Maintainers basically uh, go over the backlog and they decide what needs to go in or you know what doesn't. And we do this by also engaging with the community and trying to assess how uh, how much you know uh, uh, critical issues are, are there, you know how many bugs there are, uh, in as opposed to you know just feature additions and enhancements and things like that. Then once uh, features go in, basically it's free game for everyone. Like everyone can just go to the backlog, pick an issue, and start uh, working on it. Um, and then as as we go uh, towards the end of the release. And uh, like you mentioned correctly, uh, releases between you know five to six weeks. Sometimes it's, it's seven weeks if we're not sure that you know we have all the necessary stability tests running. But as we approach the end of the uh, um, of the release, we call it an end game. That's something that we actually took from VS Code. Um, that's a process that they have. And then in the end game, we have this huge checklist where we we form a release team, and the members of the release team changes. Um, we are going to document how one can go about to join a release team uh, pretty soon. But the core of the issue is you can go, you can go join the release team, um, and then you're, you're granted these special permissions where you can actually release Dapper bits uh, into the public. You basically work. If you're on the release team, you work with the maintainers across all the repositories. You look at the issue. You make sure that you know there is docs for everything, that you know that no feature went in without docs. Otherwise, if there's no docs, it doesn't really exist, right? Um, you make sure that there is no performance regressions. You make sure that all of the tests are running. Um, and then once that is done, uh, we basically go and actually re release the bits and, and we schedule that entire process over the course of a day or two. And then once everything's done, you know, we uh, tweet on Twitter and mention on Discord and uh, everything uh, just- And the blog. Users. Yeah, sorry. And the blog, yeah. And the blog, yes, yes, sorry, and the blog. <laughs> Yeah, and, and thank you so much for uh, uh, mentioning the need for docs. As a docs maintainer, that's uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. Absolutely, if we have a new feature and it's not in the docs, it's like it doesn't exist, because how will people know about it? How will people know how to use it? Uh, so whenever you're contributing, um, that's an important piece to have. So we actually have a, our first question um, from the chat, and that kind of goes back to uh, when we talked a little bit about the, the community structure. So Yaron, can you share a little bit about the open governance model? This is a question from Shankar uh, for the project. And uh, I'll add to that maybe a little bit of how we evolved, because we definitely kind of built, uh, moved into an open uh, governance um, uh, model. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And while I'm talking about that, if you can put the link to the Dapper community repository in the chat, that'll be great, um, because that has all the info. So if you really want to uh, read it all about the open governance, just go to the uh, Dapper slash community repository and read there. Um, but basically when Dapper was first announced, 
Um, you know, all, all, most of them, all of the maintainers, I think, you know, were from Microsoft, um, and the, the project was was you know governed under uh, you know the MIT license, but mostly under Microsoft. Um, we did announce uh, when we first open sourced it that uh, our intention was to give to a foundation, and you know, in parallel to that, also go for open governance. So the the importance of ensuring vendor neutrality was really there from the beginning, and that's even decoupled from the CNCF submission. For example, now we have a steering committee with no major, with no overrepresentation from one single vendor, even before Dapper in the CNCF. So today we have a, a committee of five members, two from Microsoft, two from Alibaba Cloud, and one from Intel. So there is like no one has any overrepresentation, um, which means that the, the project is indeed vendor neutral. Uh, we have maintainer diversity from multiple companies. Um, you see two from Microsoft here, one from Automatic, which is Rob, and uh, one from Roadwork, which is Xavier. We also have additional maintainers uh, from Apple, um, Alibaba Cloud, obviously. And um, yeah, so the, the, the steering committee is, is really the body that governs the project. So for example, right, something you know extreme, if you want to change the name of the project, the steering committee would get to make that decision. Right, so no one company or no one entity can make that decision on behalf of the Dapper project. It needs to be voted on. There needs to be consensus, and of course, the steering committee works with maintainers and with the general community to to drive you know major features and changes into the project. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great point. So this is kind of like how we're ensuring Dapper remains open. I kind of hope they don't change the name. By the way, I like Dapper, but. You no know, one I'm wants to change the name. Good, good. You're a member of the steering committee, so at least we know your position on that. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I think we got a, another question, and I think this was kind of inspired maybe by Xavier and, and Rob's examples of becoming maintainers. Um, Abilash asked, like, uh, if I want to develop a new SDK for a new language, which existing SDK should I refer? Uh, is there any documentation available for new SDK developers? Um, so, that. sorry, what was, was that for me? Or? Yeah, if you, if you want to take that, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm really passionate about SDKs. Um, as, as you can see, uh, wow. SDKs, I would really want someone to, uh, take ownership of a Rust SDK, uh, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there are many developers trying to use the Rust SDK. I think it could it could be a lot better. So you know, for me, it's it's basically uh, the Rust SDK. Uh, regarding documentation for SDK developers, um, the best thing to do, the best documentation is to look at other SDKs. And I'm going to point you to the JavaScript and PHP SDKs as really good examples um, of of SDKs that just implement the Dapper API in a, in a beautiful way. Done again by Xavier and Rob here. Um, so yeah, just looking at other SDKs, you know, there's there's an API spec to Dapper, so you can go ahead and look at that. Like you can go into the docs, go to the reference section, look at the APIs, and then see all of the APIs that the SDK should implement. You can do that. And then the, the most important thing to remember is, um, you know, we, we want to ensure that the SDKs are natural for developers using the language of the choice. And we we would like that over consistency, right? So, you know, like it doesn't have to be past color camel case everywhere, but it's important that the code that the SDK exposes for developers is, is very natural for the language in which, in which it's being implemented. Yeah, and just to mention uh, that we have several SDKs available today uh, for uh, .NET, for Java, for Python, of course, for PHP and, Java, uh, and JavaScript, as we mentioned. And like Jerome said, we, are, we see that as an important part of Dapper being uh, friendly to developers in any language because uh, Dapper is really language agnostic. Um, so additional SDKs would definitely help, but I would also ask people to help and um, just improve the current SDKs um, and the documentation around them because that's really essential, we find, to people's experience with Dapper and how they build things with Dapper. Um, so next up, um, maybe Arthur, this one will go to you as well. Um, so how, so we talked about contributing different things, um, and we talked a little bit about releases. Uh, Dapper has a roadmap as well. So if I'm somebody who's not a maintainer, I want to understand what the roadmap is. I maybe want to influence it. 
Can you tell us a little bit how the roadmap is being put together and how maybe people in the community can uh, check it out and maybe even influence it? Oh, you're muted. So um, great question. So first, uh, we have a roadmap project on GitHub. Um, and you can look at that and see what is coming up next for DAPA. Uh, there are a few ways you can influence uh, the roadmap. For existing items, you can obviously go to the roadmap, pick one item that is, is in your interest. You can comment on that, and it can explain the scenario that you're going through and why this is important, what, what scenario is going to unblock uh, by us delivering that, that particular issue. So uh, being scenario-driven is very important. Um, more than the feature itself. So uh, that helps uh, um, create a conversation uh, among maintainers uh, and give us a sense of priority, okay? Because if it's affecting you, it's probably affecting other people as well. So there's the one thing. The other thing is um, uh, once in a while, you're gonna see issues popping up on Dapper uh, list of uh, issues uh, that is pinned asking for community feedback or even voting. So engage on those. So if you're asking for your vote, uh, uh, vote. And if you don't want to comment, you don't, you don't need to comment. Uh, uh, but like, click on that. Make sure you choose the option uh, that that can give us a sense of 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 uh, uh, popularity on a given issue. Um, and then also, when you have me a scenario that you want us to work on, um, when you're creating the issue, uh, a new issue about a problem or a new feature. Uh, please be as descriptive as possible. And um, if it's a new feature, make sure you include the scenario you're enabling. Again, scenario is very important. If it's a bug, uh, explain how to reproduce a bug and what we're blocking you from doing. Uh, so we have we had some some examples of that that trigger hot fixes in 1.4 release, which is the last the latest release we had. Um, and it was very clear the center that was being blocked, and then we have to work uh, 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 on the hotfix. Um, so I think these are the, the best ways to influence. Um, if you want to also uh, 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 contribute on the chat, you can also chat and, and have a discussion with, with a maintainer if the maintainer is, is, is live. Uh, but issues is the best way because uh, you're not always online at the same time, right? So. Um, I think I think issues is the best way to to try to influence the the release. Okay, so it sounds like the best way to uh, understand what the roadmap is is of course on GitHub. We actually have even a project that says what's kind of planned and what's uh, going forward, and also engaging in proposals. So you can either open a proposal as an issue in the right repo. Uh, and, and please be as detailed as you can and also engage on them. And we actually, all the maintainers, we look at those and even just upvoting a proposal helps us understand is this scenario a common one? Is this a problem that a lot of people are seeing and we can um, um, uh, kind of solve problems for the entire community? I know we, we have a couple more questions from the chat, but before that, I do want to ask a general question. Um, about maybe the current roadmap. Um, um, so I, I want to ask all of you in the panel, is there anything right now on the panel that you are excited about or did you want to um, see moving forward? Maybe Xavier, uh, we can start with you. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward. I, I think it was mentioned earlier as well in the keynote, uh, the config API, um, because uh, I currently see myself constantly dragging configs in, in different ways. So it would be awesome to see that streamlined uh, and utilize Dapper for that as well. So that's even like a brand new building block, really, uh, in the Dapper terminology, a new API, which I believe Alibaba is also very much involved uh, in shaping that. Um, that's a great thing on the roadmap. Uh, Rob, do you, do you have anything you're looking forward to? Yeah, uh, so I haven't followed it very closely in the last couple of weeks, but uh, there's okay. been some rumbling about a querying API and all that kind of stuff on State Store. I'm super excited about that, not having to do my own indices. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's something we actually heard quite a bit from people using Dapper, looking to expand the State Store uh, retrieval of state uh, into something a little more sophisticated with some form of querying. Um, Archer, anything you're keeping an eye on? 
Uh, yes, uh, I have a, my own list here. So the query state API definitely is a, I think is a good example also for how the community uh, had the voice heard. <laughs> uh, it was like, well, it's like everybody was asking for that. Um, the configuration API as well, like like Shirvi said. And also there's a resiliency uh, proposal uh, up um, uh, by Phil. And um, that actually is, is, is one of my favorites because it will enable a lot of uh, retry logic to move out of the app code into Dapper. And it's a boilerplate code that people usually have to write over and over again. And it's gonna include retry configuration, timeout configuration, and also circuit breaking built-in. So it's it's very exciting actually. It's gonna bring Dapper to a whole new level across building blocks. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah, great. Uh, and Yaron, I know we heard a few of your favorites in the keynote. Um, but maybe you want to add to that. Yeah, I'll actually uh, add something that relates to a question that was asked, asked in the chat by Martin Brendel. So he asked, uh, is there a roadmap for supporting pluggable components that come from external source, meaning that you don't have to compile the plugin into the Docker runtime? And the, the answer is yes, uh, this is on the roadmap. So uh, we're looking at two main methods in how we can enable external plugins, uh, components really. Um, you know, Golang doesn't really have a, a good way to deal with this today. So first we're looking at gRPC components where you can just write a gRPC process that can run next to the Dapper sidecar simply cells and can register itself as a component, as any type of component. You know, there will be a perfect there, obviously, um, but if it's running locally, it might be able to utilize Unix domain sockets, which Dapper now supports thanks to Intel contributions. So that's one way. And also we're looking at uh, WASM filters um, as, a, as an additional way, um, you know, for writing like in C++ or Rust or, you know, any language that, you know, easily compiles into WASM, you'll be able to write these plugins um, that can get executed. So we basically want to take the, the Dapper component interfaces and create other proto gRPC and WASM equivalents. Um, those are two ways. There are other ways, but, you know, it's, it's on our uh, GitHub issue. So if you want to join the discussion there, uh, we'll be glad to have you join in, uh, Martin. Yeah, and just staying on the on the topic of components, I see we have another question from Lauren uh, that when will components, when do you think we'll be able to develop components in other languages? Uh, I'm assuming other languages than Go where they're uh, developed right now, uh, like C Sharp, for example. Is there any plan of, of enabling that? Yeah, it's, it's that. So if, when we enable gRPC and WASM components, you'll be able to write, you know, for example, for gRPC components, you'll be able to write components in any language that's supported by gRPC. Um, same goes for WASM. So yeah, that, that issue will basically solve for uh, multi-language components too. Yeah, so to me, it sounds like component, uh, the component model, which you actually mentioned that in the keynote, which is basically Dapper's biggest kind of extensibility, that will kind of bring it to the next level of extensibility, yeah. really. Yes. Um, and, and I mean, we've seen so many contributions coming in from the community with the for, in the form of components that really make Dapper so useful in so many different scenarios, different environments, different kind of public clouds. Um, and, and just enabling people to do more of that is, is absolutely going to be amazing for the Dapper ecosystem um, in general. So I actually uh, want to move forward now to kind of giving some guidance uh, for people who want to contribute. So hearing about all this good stuff, so we heard about the release, we heard about the roadmap, we kind of know how to engage with it. But if I'm a new contributor, what's the best way uh, for a new person to start contributing uh, into Dapper? And maybe maybe actually on this this part, I'll start as, the, as a docs maintainer. Um, I think that docs is actually a great opportunity to get your feet wet uh, with, with uh, contributing to, to Dapper, especially if you're new to contributing to open source, I think a doc is really an easy way to do it. Our docs are actually built using Hugo. Uh, it's very easy to figure out if you know Markdown, you basically can contribute uh, to, to the docs. You can also build them locally to see kind of how it works. Um, so as we said, any contribution that helps Dapper become a better uh, uh, project is welcomed. And in the docs, that includes things like even uh, typos and misspelled words. That's that's a great first contribution. Just get your feet wet, see how the process is going. Um, 
of course, broken links. Of course, if something you feel is not there and needs to be maybe elaborated on. And of course, as we said before, if you are contributing code, you definitely want to contribute the docs that would reflect the, the change in behavior or the new feature in there. So I would recommend uh, going to the docs whenever you see something uh, that you feel, hey, that needs to change. Um, we have kind of like a branching strategy and there's some, some guidance in the docs about how to contribute to the docs. So please check that out. Uh, but I think that's a great place to start. Um, and we also try to have uh, the, the uh, good first issue, which is kind of like a standard in GitHub in general to for new people to, to find issues that have been opened and they want to address. Um, any, any of you have any recommendations or, or kind of ideas on how to get started contributing to Dapper? Yeah, I think the, the good first issue label is, is definitely something you should check out. Uh, we, we just recently added a couple of them to the JavaScript SDK, um, where even someone already picked them picked them up. Uh, it's typically something like creating an example for invocation. How can you do an invocation with the SDK? So I, I think it's it's perfect to start with those. It couples some of the documentation that you, you have to read for that together with some of the code writing already. And then you really gradually roll into the project contributing to everything. Uh, and then once you get your, your, your head around everything, all the concepts, of Dapper, you can start contributing to all the, the SDKs and really the inner parts of that. Yeah, Arthur, do you do you have anything to add to that? Maybe. Um, yes. So um, there is code contribution uh, via documentation or via code. Uh, also, uh, answering questions on Discord is a way of contributing as well. So join the Discord channel um, and. Um, Another contribution that people uh, can do, and, and and it's not that obvious, is that you don't actually need to be an approver or a maintainer to review pull requests. So if you if you feel comfortable with the programming language, and you want to like, oh, let me look at this PR, let's see what it does, you might be able to find, to catch uh, 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 obvious mistakes on the language itself, uh, not necessarily in the Dapper context, but the context of the language that you can you can help the maintainer. Oh, I caught these issues for you in this PR. Um, so that also helps. Although your approval does not necessarily count, uh, you, you can definitely find issues in, in pull requests. Um, and also testing components. So a components contrib uh, keeps growing. Um, not every component is in GA. Uh, not every component is in the conformance test list. So if you can add a component to the conformance test list uh, uh, or pass it out manuals. So for example, if you are passionate about MySQL and you want to validate the MySQL test uh, state store. You can do that and find issues and report issues back to the community. So uh, you can, uh, that's also another way to contribute as well. Yeah, that's, that's great. I think, uh, as we said, and we keep saying, like the, the components is a big opportunity to, to contribute and help Dapper grow. Um, maybe in that point, we can take a, a question from earlier from Oliver about AWS and GCP. Um, uh, contributions, your own. Do, do you have anything to maybe shed some light on that? Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, the, the Dapper project welcomes everyone to work on Dapper. Uh, Microsoft, AWS, Google, any major Alibaba. Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, yes, they, they've been with us from literally the beginning almost. Um, and we have been seeing contributions coming in from uh, Google recently. Um, I personally haven't seen from AWS. Uh, you know, anything that, that was coming in. So yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that they will uh, join the, the Dapper project. Um, they are most welcome. So we haven't seen from officially from AWS, but we definitely have people in the community who are running applications that use Dapper on AWS and they themselves made uh, contributions yeah. in, even in the form of components, authentication to AWS services and so on. So you also have the ability to extend that ecosystem in the direction of really any environment you're working on, um, uh, just by by being somebody who's uh, knowledgeable uh, and uh, and has uh, some skill in the in the language or, or the domain like the, the hosting environment. So we we really uh, love seeing those come in. Um, Arthur, uh, I believe there's another question here uh, about the criteria for components to become GA. Can you maybe talk about that? Yes, that is that is actually a great question. Um, we have been exploring that recently. 
So uh, the criteria to BGA right now is that the components should be uh, passing the conformance test. Um, it needs to have at least two production uh, use cases. Uh, and uh, it has to be maintained uh, by, 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 one, by at least one person plus the maintainers uh, of, the, of the project. So we are um, actually exploring change in that criteria. So it is, uh, there's a proposal for that. And that proposal is also uh, being uh, brought up to review to the steering committee. So uh, it's a great question. And then um, we are actually exploring changing that. Um, maybe Yadin, do you want to take a step on that as well? Um, no, I think you did a pretty good job you know, describing it. We are working towards changing the criteria, um, the GA criteria specifically now. Um, for just making it a little bit, bit more easier, uh, you know, and robust for, and, and also clear and very explicit for how to get a, a component going from beta to GA. Um, because we yeah. did hear from the community, you know, where lots of users are like, yeah, like the Dapper APIs are 1.0, they're stable, they're backward compatible, but we want the components themselves to have this GA qualification where, you know, we can make a bet that the component API doesn't change. So that's uh, a really good uh, motivation for us to bring uh, as many components as possible to GA. And, and one thing that we hear uh, uh, feedback from the existing criteria is that um, it, it uh, requires two production uses uh, of, the, uh, of the component to be called, uh, to be part of uh, GA, but also have people waiting for it to be GA for them to use in production. So it becomes a chicken and egg problem uh, 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 with the current criteria. So that's a, that's a feedback that we got. So we're looking to that now. Yeah, great. Um, now I, I kind of want to move on. So we talked about maybe uh, how to get started with contributing and 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 the roadmap and all that. Um, so let's say I'm, I decide to contribute. Uh, I wonder if you can give a little bit of insight uh, as as not just maintainers as, as approvers, which, which is part of the of the maintainer work. Uh, what kind of things are you looking for in a PR? How can I make a, a more kind of uh, efficient kind of contribution, save some time? Um, I know, Rob, maybe maybe you have some tips and tricks for somebody, uh, what to look for, what to do, definitely in your repo or any repo, really. Yeah, so I think the first thing is that it needs to solve some sort of problem or uh, provide something new. and. I, I think that's a key point, but not necessarily. Like it could just be refactoring and cleaning stuff up, which in my mind solves a problem of cleaning up some code. So it's, I think that's like the first thing. And then beyond that, like the sky's the limit. Like I, I don't, I don't really have anything super specific, but you know, those are just my two criteria. So yeah, uh, Xavier, do you have any? pointers for people who want to maybe contribute to the JavaScript SDK or, again, anywhere? Yeah, no, no, definitely. So I, I think one of the most important things I look at when, when reviewing a PR is um, does it follow some of the code styling at least? Uh, I think it's important to have clean code everywhere uh, that it's documented well. Um, if that's not there, I will just comment on it and make sure that people see it and that they add on it and that we work together on actually solving the, the PR. Um, so feel free to contribute. If, if, you, if you feel unsure, feel free to shoot questions on Discord, uh, anywhere else on, on the GitHub issue even, and then we just walk through it together. Yeah, and I think that you actually made a really good point that the maintainers and approvers of the Dapper project are really available. Uh, we we sometimes take a little bit of time to, to get to, uh, to everything, but uh, because we just have an overwhelming, uh, uh, excited, and energetic community. Um, but we are available on Discord. We are definitely going to interact with you on your PR on GitHub. Um, I, I would add to all that that um, we really want to see PRs attached to issues. Uh, the issue is really where we have the discussion and the conversation on whether the PR is necessary, what if there's any design issue there um, that we want to make sure that we kind of uh, work that out. Um, and also letting the community kind of chime in, as we said before, on, on what the thing is that you're doing. If you're just fixing a bug, then of course that should be an easy one. You just reference the bug. Um, I can tell you in the docs, yeah, if it's a typo or something like that, probably you don't need an issue. If you really want to restructure something or want to add something significant, we really want to have these discussions on issues. 
maybe just one more thing before I kind of let Archer and Yaron also kind of chime in. Um, in the doc specifically, uh, Xavier, Xavier mentioned in his uh, repo uh, style, code styling guides, uh, in the docs, we have kind of style and tone uh, for the documentation. And this is just an effort for us to be consistent. Different documentation in different projects take different choices. Um, we kind of outline them all in, in the contributing section of the docs, and you can see how to contribute to the docs. So some of the wording, some of the phrasing, um, that could save us a lot of time. Uh, and sometimes you'll see us just suggest stuff. GitHub has this suggestion uh, feature where we kind of like say, how about considering maybe rephrasing it this way? That makes it easier. Uh, but sometimes uh, we know not everybody also is an English speaker. Um, and if you want some help with phrasing stuff, then we're happy to kind of jump in also and, and work with you on that. So I would say in the docs, definitely read the styling and um, and tone guidance. Um, and also, again, going back to uh, what I said before, just having an issue attached to it. Your own, is there anything yeah. you want to add to that or Arthur? I just wanted to add one thing that um, 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 just crossed my mind. Uh, because we are post 1.0 version, uh, we also look out for breaking changes. So uh, we, every change has to be backwards compatible. Uh, unless it is removing code that was marked as duplicated before. So uh, we really watch out for that. I, I especially watch out for that on every PR. Uh, look, out, look out for breaking changes. Yeah, your own, anything to add? Um, no, uh, Arthur actually just mentioned what I was gonna say. Uh, I, I think okay. that's, yeah, that's really important. Yeah, I think as we see Dapper kind of being um, adopted more and more, and really people, you know, we, we put version 1.0, which was the first production ready kind of official release of Dapper in February. So of course it takes time for people to actually build production systems. But now we have quite a few uh, people adopting Dapper and we're gonna hear from them actually in other sessions in this day, especially in the other panel. So looking forward to that. Um, but breaking changes is, is, is a serious thing. We take that very seriously. And that is one of the things we're really uh, looking for, definitely, uh, of course, in the code. Um, yeah, OK, great. Um, so I guess um, we only have a, a couple of minutes left. I'll give you the maintainers uh, an opportunity to maybe do kind of a call to action. Is there anything, uh, really briefly, one sentence that you want maybe people to engage with, help you with, uh, contribute to Dapper? Let's go around uh, the room. Your own, let's start with you. Yeah, um, well, I would like to see more contributions around uh, Google Cloud Components in particular. So if you go to Components Contrib and you look at, you know, or to, to the Dapper docs and look at the reference section, um, we're a little low on, on GCP components. It would be awesome to have the community add those. Um, yeah, so that's that's just great. And, you know, just in general, go to the Dapper runtime, look at the issues, look at the issues in the upcoming release and just help maintainers out. Um, I, I really love our community. And also make sure that you join the Discord channel. There's, awesome. you know, talks there about really interesting stuff that, that don't necessarily have to do with Dapper. Just, you know, people talking about any kinds of development problems out there. Okay. Thank you. Very briefly, Xavier. I, I will try to keep it short. Uh, so I, I think for me, the, the, the most two important things as well to, to, to get some help on is, is documentation. Uh, and then the next one is examples, and more specifically end-to-end -end examples, where it's really used in, in small projects. Great. Rob? I'll echo, echo Xavier exactly the same. Like We definitely need some more examples in PHP land and some more uh, um, and some more documentation, I think. Uh, there's a big release that I've been working on the documentation for quite a while that I could use some help on, so. Great, Archer? Um, yes, um, so more specifically, um, we are looking for uh, new uh, approvals and maintainers on the Java SDK. So if you are a Java developer and wanna get involved with the Java SDK, there's a big opportunity now. Uh, so look at the issues, uh, uh, look at uh, PRs, and, and ping me. Uh, I'm happy to work with you on a plan to, to have uh, new approvers and future maintainers. Great, you thank you. Um, so thank you again for, for everybody for tuning in. Thank you for the maintainers on the panel for, for kind of answering all these questions. I really recommend everybody go check out the Dapper slash community repo to learn more about how to engage and the contributing guidance 
in the Dapper Docs and talk to us on GitHub, on Discord, and have a great rest of your DapperCon. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Hello, and welcome to another session at DapperCon. My name is Ori Zohar. I'm a maintainer of Dapper, specifically of the docs. I am joined here by Simon, who has uh, graciously accepted the, the offer to share some of his learnings and his journey uh, uh, as part of the man group uh, to adopt Dapper. Hi, Simon. Welcome. Hi, Ori. How are you doing? Good. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, man group and, and what you're doing over there, about the company, about yourself? Sure. Uh, so my name is Simon Jones. I'm the head of platform engineering at Man Group. And my team focuses on the continuous evolution of our core trading platform and delivery processes. Uh, Man Group was founded in 1783. We're a publicly listed active investment management firm with over $135 billion in managed funds. And we operate in a highly regulated financial services industry where data privacy and security is paramount, as is platform stability to meet legal requirements such as time sensitive trade reporting uh, to regulatory institutions. So our applications, our services, our sensitive data are all primarily hosted in our private data centers that we own. They're geographically distributed with redundancies for disaster recovery. But there's very little that we have that leverages the cloud at this time. Um, in terms of Man Group itself, we have several front office business investment management units. Um, each of them leverages the technology that's most appropriate for their needs. That could be Python for data science, machine learning, and rapid prototyping, uh, to Java and .NET. We have a range of languages that we uh, support. And the transactions from these front office systems they all flow through our core trading and operations platform, which is primarily written in .NET. And it consists of hundreds of individual services and multiple promotional environments from dev all the way through to production. And our whole business needs to continuously innovate new financial products to stay competitive in what we all know as ever-changing market conditions. So, we try to avoid large, expensive technology projects that have a long lead time before delivering value. Instead, we prefer to incrementally evolve our existing platform, which helps to maintain stability and extend the value of our previous development investment while continuing to meet, meet the needs of, the, of this business with their need to rapidly evolve and create new uh, products. What that means, though, is you end up with a with a platform that's been evolved over a long period of time, which now encompasses a wide range of framework versions, communication technologies, and hosting models, all of which you are continuing to maintain while you're continuing to build on top of that. That sounds like a you know a, a critical system to the business that obviously has to be resilient. It's in a regulated industry and also has some legacy code in there, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Uh, can we maybe take a look at the architecture uh, even before maybe you use Dapper and how it looks like? Yeah, that's a good idea. So um, we've got a diagram here which we can use to walk through how such a system may evolve over time. Um, as we look at this, we're going to look for work from left to right across it. So starting on the left-hand side, what you see is Let's say you're starting out developing this platform like we did some time ago, and you decide to use Microsoft technologies at the time, um, and you're just using things like Windows clients and servers. Uh, at the time, I chose .NET, the 3.5 framework, with 
Windows Communication Foundation for API endpoints, maybe using TCP and XML, Windows Service Hosting, Windows Authentication, a SQL Server backend, MSMQ for messaging, and maybe Windows Presentation Foundation for a front end. And this is what all was available as the what was, may have been cutting edge at the time you started out. It's an integrated set of technologies that gives you rapid development, good tooling, uh, a stable platform, and you deploy this to production and you start building on it. You roll out a number of services using that technology. And that's all working great. And then over time, newer versions of the .NET framework comes along, like .NET 4, up to .NET 4.8. And we can keep using everything that we had before in that foot on the left-hand side. We can use the same authorization, Windows um, authorization. We can use the same hosting, the user interfaces, MSMQ. All of this is still compatible with those frameworks. So that's fine. We can carry on building on those platforms. But then let's say in the client section, our other business units come along and they want to develop applications themselves, like the Java team will have got an application they want to talk to our systems or the Python team have. And we've been using Windows authentication with all of our services to identify clients and users, and they can use that as well because that's Kerberos, that's fine. But now the problem is the fact that we use WCF as a technology with TCP and XML, and it's, that's less compatible, shall we say, with uh, Java and Python. It's very much a .NET technology. However, WCF does support HTTP JSON REST type APIs like web, ser web services. So you can now leverage WCF to add a REST API to an existing service uh, or to a new service, I should say. And then those Java and Python apps can communicate your services. So you adopt a newer technology with your, uh, much, as much of the existing that you can reuse to enable other clients to talk to your system. And then moving across, let's say the next thing that comes along is .NET Core, which we know came along, and it reached a stable long-term support version with 3.1. Uh, so you can still host that on a Windows service with Windows Auto. You want to use that because it's new performance, new architecture, what everything's moving to. Uh, it can still provide HTTP REST APIs like WCF, but on ASP.NET Core. But now the problem with .NET Core is it's not compatible with your messaging technology. Remember at the beginning, we started with MSMQ and we use that for all of our messages, but .NET Core systems can't use MSMQ. So what you need now is a cross-platform messaging solution that work with .NET Core as well as with your Windows services. So you look around, let's say you choose Kafka, which is a, a centralized broker environment that does work cross-platform. And that now means that your .NET Core system can send and receive messages, but now you're probably gonna need something that bridges your MSMQ messages across Kafka so that the new services on .NET Core can consume those. But again, you're building on what's there and you're just extending it, leaving what was there before, because that's fine, that's just ticking along and you're just adding new capabilities. Um, then you might decide to deploy these .NET Core services on Linux because the, the developers decide that they like the idea of using things like containers for not just local debugging, but also for deploying to production to, uh, to make that simple. Um, so we can still use our Windows authentication technology with that. Um, and we can host the Docker containers in a standalone Docker engine. So move from Windows service hosting to Docker hosting. Uh, and we don't actually need things like Kubernetes or an orchestration platform to do this just deploy single instance containers. And then some of these newer services that say aren't using a point-to-point -point technology like MSMQ, but are leveraging Kafka, they may want to create multiple instances so they can um, consume uh, across multiple Kafka topic partitions for scaling and have throughput. Uh, so now you think that, okay, now we need to balance calls that are coming in across these instances if they have APIs as well. So you add a load balancer appliance, perhaps, a hardware device. So any calls coming in that need to go to the APIs of those services can be distributed amongst them as well. And there are some issues that you do come across, like things like you need sticky sessions for the Windows authentication. There is some more complicated hard configuration to do with some of these, but you know it works and it gives you load balancing capabilities. Um, but at some point, you're going to hit something that is going to require you to think about platform-wide changes. So this is incremental stuff you've been doing to now, but something's going to come along and make you think about, okay, I need to change the whole platform to, uh, uh, to use this. And that could be something like mobile device support. So the mobile device could be developed using a React web UI and Node.js. 
but it's unlikely to support Windows authentication. It's most likely going to use something like OAuth to do the authentication of the client and user. And if your whole system is based on Windows OAuth, you've now got to probably change some, if not all of it, to support OAuth and propagate it all the way through, which makes you think, OK, I need a, a way of applying new technologies consistently and new architectural patterns across the entire platform. That's such a range of frameworks and technologies that we're using. Um, and so that's kind of where you get to when you start thinking, OK, what's available for us to be able to take to apply new features across this entire estate in one go? Yeah, so I'm, I'm seeing I'm looking at this diagram and I'm seeing uh, different platforms uh, like Linux and mm. Windows. I'm seeing different frameworks, uh, versions of .NET and even stuff that is isn't .NET. Uh, I'm seeing different languages. Um, and as you said, this is like a thing that happens because over time you're iterating and, and improving and having more scenarios come in. So what are the, the key things that you wanted to change or improve that made you look at Dapper? Well, I think the key thing is, first of all, just to mention that the approach that we take is this incremental evolution approach. It, it retains our investment in our existing code and development you know, rather than rewriting everything. So it's it is it's very viable as an approach, but you do end, as you say, with these very wide range of technologies and frameworks over time. So there are some key things though that we wanted to add across the board. And when we decided we needed OAuth, we thought, let's look at what else we can put in at the same time. And the first thing actually was service discovery. So we wanted a consistent approach across the board to discovering and invoking other services. And Ideally, what we wanted to have was dynamic service registration. It wanted every service to start up and register itself with a central registry and provide its own health checks so that the registry would know if it was available or not. And that would give us then things like automatic traffic routing for scaling and disaster recovery, failover, and reduce or eliminate the need for the physical load balancers. And also help with things like blue green or canary deployments all of these features that you'd expect from a, like a microservices type architecture and you know, we wanted to get these across the board um but another key one was distributed tracing and we want to be able to trace call chains across the entire system because that can actually help with a continuous evolution it'll help with impact planning for service restructuring or replacement because you know what services are calling that one you were looking at and also what it's invoking as well by looking at the distributed tracing Key performance bottlenecks, identifying those and things that you want to target as you know as, uh, for update, um, and also things like even analyzing new releases for performance improvement and degradation. If you're constantly making changes, you want to see the impact of all of those changes as you make them, so you can respond to any anything that might not have gone the way you expect. Um, and also, we are all an internet at the moment. Uh, it is all firewalled. It is in our own data centers. But we may at some point want to move that or expand into the cloud. So secure communications between our services is something that we think is a very important capability for deploying to environments with a variety of security controls. So that could be authenticating security calls between trusted service over MTLS, as example, uh, where you rotate certificates regularly, encrypt the service identity so you get enhanced access controls, more finely grained permissions, and reduce the surface area. And finally, <laughs> we've had a lot of teams express interest in virtual actors. I know the technology has been around for a bit now. Uh, a lot of them have seen things like Orleans, which is popular on the .NET platform. But our Python and Java and .NET teams are all interested in creating virtual actors uh, that all communicate with each other for creating highly concurrent distributed solutions. So it's not necessarily a platform requirement, but it is an example of when the development teams come to us and say, look, we'd really like to see if there's a way of leveraging a technology across the board. So the challenge for us is always finding a way of introducing all of these capabilities and more across the entire platform in a consistent way. Yeah, so it sounds from my kind of being somebody familiar with Dapper, I heard service invocation, I heard observability, I heard MTLS, I heard actors, and what I'm seeing in an architecture with, which has multiple languages, has some legacy code, a lot of different technologies where you want to be agnostic. Sounds like Dapper would really be a good fit. Uh, can you show us how maybe you integrated uh, Dapper and maybe how this architecture looks like after Dapper is uh, integrated? Absolutely. So what we see now on the screen is another diagram that's a slightly modified version of the previous one, but showing how we could add Dapper to uh, across the entire system. 
So the first thing is to deploy Dapper alongside every service instance. So Dapper is a single executable written in Go. It's a sidecar process. So you deploy that alongside every single service that you have. And on startup, the idea is that Dapper registers itself and that service in a central registry so that any so every service then is able to discover any other service from that registry as if it's been Dapperized and invoke calls through Dapper to those services. And Dapper gives us um, automated MTLS encryption between the sidecars. We, we just get that for free with the architecture. And it also provides automated distributed telemetry between the servers as well. So any calls that we put through Dapper, we get the distributed telemetry so we can trace the calls across the services. So just by adding Dapper to all of the services, we can build up this picture of the estate if we route all the calls through them. Um, it supports and propagates OAuth credentials, uh, both over gRPC and HTTP. And we've actually developed a simple technology, a proxy technology that allows us to route WCF calls through Dapper over to another WCF endpoint. So we can get distributed telemetry for our WCF calls as well by going through Dapper. Oh, very cool. And yeah, it's, 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 that, was, that was a big win for us, being able to do that. Um, so we can add it across the board uh, to provide a broad set of platform features in a consistent way. And it allows us to create virtual actors on Python and .NET and Java. Um, so you can see how it's deployed everywhere and all the services, but what you also see there is an API gateway that we've created. And what that means is external applications can make calls into this gateway, and all they need to know is the Dapper app ID as part of the URL. And then we use Dapper under the hood to convert, Wind we convert Windows authentications to an OAuth token, and we use Dapper to discover a healthy service, that app ID, and route the call through to that automatically, and then it's OAuth throughout the chain. And I have to say, what Dapper enables is pretty amazing. You know, being able to do this all with a single component across all these platforms and frameworks is quite remarkable. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Now, um, you mentioned you are running this on prem, um, and I'm I'm seeing Dapper sidecars in each one of the servers and the API gateway as well. I know when I'm running Dapper locally, I've got um, the service discovery works through uh, MDNS, and I think when uh, uh, when it's deployed into Kubernetes, uh, it uses the Kubernetes uh, service discovery. But here you got VMs, so maybe that's a hint. But I'm seeing the HashiCorp console logo across the board. There. <laughs> how are you? Yeah. How are you doing service discovery in this environment where it's on-prem? There's no orchestrator. How do these sidecars know where they uh, where they are? That's an excellent question. So we, we were following Dapper since the first time. I think it was a, it was announced by, I think it was Mark Rosinovich at a night conference in 2019. Yeah. Um, and we started looking at it. And we were following it. It got more stable. And as we were looking at it, we started playing around with it and trying it out. But it, because of our infrastructure, we quickly realized that we, didn't, we can't move to Kubernetes. It's just not an option because the number of services that are incompatible, we have to do everything with the architecture that we have. So we wanted to be able to use Dapper, but we needed service discovery, and you obviously can't use MDNS for that. So we'd long been considering HashiCorp console as a central service discovery registry, uh, which doesn't require Kubernetes. Uh, like Dapper, it's a single standalone executable. It's deployable cross-platform. Um, so we started talking with the Dapper team of maintainers, which led us to developing and contributing the, DAP, the console service discovery component for Dapper. So we had to learn Go, but uh, we had lots of help from the Dapper community, and uh, we delivered that. And what that means is that the Dapper sidecar can now register itself, and it's the service it's associated with, with console and startup, and discover other Dapper services uh, through its own service discovery mechanism, which gives service invocation across physical hosts outside of an orchestration platform like KS, and it works really well. That's, that's terrific, and I think that's a great example of how a certain need that somebody who's using Dapper has can contribute and open up scenarios for the entire community. Because you made that contribution, that actually made service discovery like another building block, really, with components, the first one being console. Um, and that's just available to everybody right now for these kind of scenarios. Uh, another yeah. thing I was wondering about is how are you uh, uh, initiating or spinning up those Dapper sidecars for each server? Because again, in Kubernetes, we got this uh, service plane um, a Dapper service plane service that is called the sidecar injector. In this case, again, you got VMs. Uh, how does the sidecar know to start uh, with your application? 
Well, the good thing about Dapper and uh, the control plane services placement of Sentry, uh, they're all cross-platform single instance executable configured by the command line or external YAML file. So they don't need to be hosted in KS, but you do need to provide them on the application. You need to launch and bootstrap them and make them run. So what we did want was a seamless development experience for .NET developers, a way to press F5 in Visual Studio and have Dapper start and stop along with the application to automatically restart Dapper, if you shut down for any reason, to configure it and assign its ports, to route all its JSON format console log messages back through the ASP.NET Core structured logging framework for visualization and things like Kibana, to combine the health checks of Dapper with its with the, that of the service, essentially treating Dapper as a critical component, almost like a DLL, reversing the way that it's launched so it becomes a dependency of the application. And we want to be able to do that for Dapper, its sidecar, and for placement, and for Sentry to make it easy to deploy. So to achieve that, we created a lightweight component we call Dapper Sidekick, which we decided to open source to contribute back to the Dapper community. Oh, that's very cool. Can you explain a little bit about Sidekick? What what does it do? Um, I think it's probably easiest just to kind of show as well as see what it actually does. It's, uh, it's probably the, quick, the easiest awesome. thing. Awesome. Yeah, let's see a demo. Okay. Uh, so this is the GitHub website for Dapper Sidekick on the Man Group site. And this is uh, showing you all the information they need for Sidekick. It's a, available on NuGet as well. This describes how you install it. And in this area, we've got a samples folder. And we've got in the ASP.NET Core area, I've got a console sample. And we provide some information about how this works. There's some screenshots and things down here. We're going to use this now to demonstrate the use of Sidekick in .NET with console for service discovery. Sounds good. So I've I've got the uh, console project here, and uh, this is the receiver and a sender project, and this is basically the standard ASP app called weather forecast application. But we've sidekicked it and we've consoled it. But just to show you initially, if I run this project standalone without doing anything else, then it comes up and it's just hope open to port on eight thousand. And I'm not going to show you that this is this is what's to open this weather forecast. And this this is all it's doing. It's just showing you weather forecast information. This is the standard .NET template. Now, how do I sidekick this? Okay, well this is pretty easy. So in the startup, all I'm going to do is I'm going to add the sidekick uh, component. And in the project, all I've done is bring in man dapper sidekick ASP.NET Core. And that's all I've done. I've literally done that. There was nothing else changed. I've just added a package reference and selected this. So see what happens. I started again. And this time, a number of things happen. And what you'll see is it has discovered Dapper in the .dapr folder, because all I did initially was a Dapper in it. And it has started Dapper up. And it's given it some default settings. And it's given it all, um, you see all the log messages from Dapper coming through into the console window. And it started up here fine. And if I was to just do a quick um, get process, okay. we can see there's one Dapper running, 28256 is the process ID, and you can see 28256 is what it started. So it came up. If I stop my Visual Studio project, it sends the shutdown command to Dapper to stop, it waits a little bit of time for it to go away, finishes, and now if I do get process, it's Dapper is gone. So we automatically launch it and shut it down. Just by Dapper was started programmatically here, not with a CLI and not exactly. with some injector, but through your code, really. Very yep. cool. Our library will start Dapper automatically. It actually locates the executable. It configures it. It gives it the port assignments. It tells it to use JSON logging and routes it back through. It handles it all, and then it monitors the executable as it's running. So let's say I start it again. And this time, I'm going to show you, you see I've got process 1616 was started. What happens if I kill Dapper now? 1616. One, six. If I kill this process, and let me just bring this, uh, change this screen so you can actually see it more easily. So you've got the two side by side. If I kill 1616, one, it immediately detects that Dapper's gone away. So I'm going to restart it in five seconds. There's no Dapper process down here now. And it has restarted if you look at the screen above. And if I check again, it's brought it back up again and it's reconnected to it. So it will automatically restart it if it dies. So it's continually maintaining the state of it. And if I stop Visual Studio, then you'll see the process has gone away. So just F5, start and stop. Very there cool. is a, 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 there's one other thing I'll show here before we look at console. And that's just to show that if I bring in um, another bit here, I'm going to bring in health check endpoints. 
And what that means is that um, if I start this again now, and it'll bring up console again now, and I've still got my weather forecast here, but if I check my health on this endpoint, it says healthy. It says healthy at the moment. And if I now, let's, let's see what dapper it started, 23888. If I kill 23888 and I refresh this, it's gone unhealthy because dapper has gone away. And in a couple of seconds, you'll see this go back to healthy again. And this is what's needed for console integration. It's us tracking the state of the thing that we own, essentially dapper, and keeping track of the health status. That's very cool. So you got the resiliency as well without an orchestrator. Can we take a look at the console bit? Uh, we yes, that's, absolutely. So yeah. console is a standalone executable. So I'm just going to launch console as a standalone agent right now uh, in dev mode. And that means I can have my own console host running locally. And I go to console. And you can see here, console has started up. This is the local host. And the only thing registered with it now is console. So how do I change my existing Dapper project to support console? So what we can do is we can add a Dapper config YAML to our project, and it'll automatically get used and deployed with our project and used to configure Dapper. And I haven't got any console support in here yet, but I do now. So <laughs> what this will do is it'll basically say, I want to self-register the service on startup. It'll tell it the health end check point to check, tell console what to check. And we register things like the Dapper ports. Um, and also, I'm adding uh, some tracing here for Zipkin. So that's all I've done. I have literally just started that. If I start it up again now, and then we can take a look at console. And you can see it's come up here, console sample receiver, and it's gone healthy straight away because my service is healthy. So it's this is the Dapper, itself and it's running. This is the Dapper sidecar talking to console, and console seeing that. You're, you're using yep. the console um, dashboard to actually see the sidecar. Exactly right. And the, the cool thing now is if I was to uh, chain, to kill this process, so let's see which one it just brought up. It brought up 38948. If I kill that, 38948, then if you watch the console when it's gone unhealthy straight away, I've killed Dapper. The console knows it's unhealthy because it's a unified health check endpoint in the service. And now it's gone healthy again because we restarted Dapper and it came back again. So you can see how console's constantly monitoring it. That's very cool. Um, yeah. But it gets better. So what I can do now is start two projects together. So I've got another project here, a sender project. This is also configured to self-register with Dapper on startup. But this has got a controller method on it that is going to actually invoke the weather forecast endpoint on the console sample receiver project, which is this one. This is the app ID that gets registered with Dapper in console. And all I'm doing here is creating an HTTP client for to talk to that app ID on that remote console uh, registered service through Dapper to, invent, to in, drip back, invoke that same weather forecast endpoint. So service A, sorry, sender service, going through its own Dapper sidecar over to the Dapper sidecar of the receiver service, executing the weather forecast, return the result via console registration and both them bootstrapping and running Dapper automatically. And this is how it would work across multiple hosts. So if I run this one now, we get two services coming up. That's the one, and the other one is uh, here. Um, it's come up again. There we go. It's running. It's running. And if I go back to console, you'll see I've got two services here now: sender and receiver. And what this has done, this has brought up a little swagger UI for me here. This is the sender swagger UI. I've got a sender Dapper weather forecast. This is the controller method we were just looking at. And if I execute this. This gives me a weather forecast back. I've received it. I've just called wet, wet Dapper weather forecast on that controller. And if you go to um, Zipkin now, for example, because this is all going through the Dapper sidecars to prove to you that I just did a distributed call, I can go to Zipkin. I now have a call in Zipkin. And if you look at this, this is showing that the console sender application called the receiver application. So I've got my automatic distributed tracing over Dapper for free. That's, that's great, uh -oh. Simon. Uh, looks yeah. like we're out of time. I think we've seen console used for server discovery. We've seen the side pick that lets you programmatically start Dapper as a uh, um, just and have that resiliency. And that's, that's a, a great addition as well, plus the observability you get through it. So these are awesome contributions. Uh, Sidekick is open source. Obviously, console has been contributed, so that's available to the community. I think this is a, a terrific example of um, a company kind of taking on Dapper, having legacy code, being um, in a regulated industry. So it's not really easy to 
take these things in, but still uh, being uh, tremendously innovative and, and forward-looking. Uh, thank you so much, Simon, for sharing all this uh, and showing us. It's a pleasure. Cover. Yeah, and thank you, all of you, for joining us and tuning in. Uh, have a, a great Apricon. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Dean. Welcome to DapperCon. Today we're gonna to be talking about key considerations for running Dapper in production. We will start by reviewing the landscape of microservice development and what problems Dapper solves. Then we will cover key considerations for running and using Dapper in production with Kubernetes. And at the end, we'll walk through some next steps and provide resources to get involved with the Dapper community and learn even more. Let's start with a brief overview of microservice development and how Dapper simplifies this for us. No matter what industry we're in, writing software has common patterns. We reduce costs by only using the resources we need and scaling out when additional resources are required. Applications are being broken down into units of functionality each exposed as a service. We want to focus on adding business value and not managing infrastructure. So we leverage serverless platforms and use DevOps best practices. And the number of programming languages seems to never stop growing. And we should always use the best language for the task at hand. On the surface, microservice development seems simple enough. It's a micro or small service and not a giant scary monolith. However, there are limited tools and runtimes to support truly distributed development. And many of the frameworks are tightly coupled to a specific language or development stack. A typical microservice application might look like this. Several small purpose-built services all talking to each other. Some of the services also talk to external resources to store state or ingest events. Getting an application like this up and running and keeping it running has proven to be challenging. At its core, Dapper is a set of building blocks, including service-to-service -service invocation, state management, pub sub, bindings, and secrets management, with support for the actor model and observability right out of the box. We can use as much or as little as we like. For example, if we have already solved service-to-service -service invocation, but need help with state management, we can just use the state management building block. Or if we're starting from nothing, we can use it all, allowing us to focus on what matters, adding business value. Any language that can send an HTTP or gRPC request can use these building blocks. This is one of the reasons Dapper is so powerful. Not only can applications that leverage Dapper use any language, they can be run on any infrastructure. The components are the real magic behind Dapper. Switching from Redis to Cosmos DB or from RabbitMQ to Azure Service Bus requires zero code changes. We simply update our configuration and the code gets to stay the same. If we do not see a component we need, no problem. They're all open source and we can add whatever we need by simply submitting a pull request. The goals are to take years of experience and best practices and make them easy to use for any language and on any stack. Dapper is driven by standards and provides a consistent, portable, and open API that can be extended and used in any cloud and on the edge. It was developed by the cloud native community as a way to ease distributed application development. To recap, Dapper offers best practice building blocks, consistent, portable, and open APIs, extensible and pluggable components, it supports any language or framework, it's platform agnostic, and it's community driven and completely vendor neutral. Now that we understand microservice development challenges and Dapper's goals better, let us shift our focus to deploying Dapper in production. There are five Dapper control plane deployments, operator, sidecar injector, sentry, placement, 
and dashboard. When deploying Dapper in a production-ready configuration, it's recommended to deploy with a highly available configuration of the Dapper control plane. A highly available configuration will create three replicas of each Dapper control plane pod in the Dapper system namespace. And it allows the Dapper control plane to survive Kubernetes node failures and other outages. When using Dapper in production with Kubernetes, you should also run a Kubernetes cluster of at least three worker nodes to support a highly available installation with the Dapper control plane resource requests and limits also defined. While resource settings requirements will vary depending on cluster size, the resource request and limits table here shows a good starting point, though individual testing will be needed to find the right values for your environment. You can install Dapper one of three ways. First, you can use the Dapper CLI. This is the recommended way to get started with Dapper. Second, if you prefer, you can use Helm. If you choose to use Helm, it's recommended to create a values file instead of specifying parameters on the command line. This file should be checked into source control so you can track changes made to it. It's important to note the latest Dapper Helm chart no longer supports Helm version 2. You will need to migrate from Helm version 2 to Helm version 3 if you wish to use this installation method. Third, if you're using Dapper in production properly, you will have continuous integration and continuous delivery configured for your application delivery. If you're familiar with GitHub Actions and are using it for your CI CD, Dapper can be integrated with GitHub Actions via the Dapper Tool Installer, available right in the GitHub Marketplace. This installer adds the Dapper CLI to your workflow, allowing you to deploy, manage, and upgrade Dapper across your environments. Here are examples of the three different ways to install and deploy Dapper. You can see using the Dapper CLI is the easiest as it's one line of code. Helm requires a few extra steps, but you can check in your configuration to source control, thus allowing you to track configuration changes. Finally, with GitHub Actions, there is a native step allowing you to set up Dapper on your GitHub Actions runner, thereby providing access to the Dapper CLI. The Dapper Setup Dapper Action will install the specified version of the Dapper CLI on Mac OS, Linux, and Windows runners. Once installed, you can run any Dapper CLI command to manage your Dapper environments. Notice both the Dapper CLI and Helm examples use a flag to enable high availability for Dapper. Like installing Dapper, you can use the Dapper CLI or Helm to upgrade Dapper in Kubernetes. It also supports zero downtime upgrades. The upgrade path looks a little like this. First, update the CLI version. This is optional, but recommended, as this will upgrade the CLI for the client. This can be your workstation or your CI server or runner. Second, update the Dapper control plane itself. This is what is deployed in the Dapper system namespace and is made up of those five deployments we spoke of earlier. Third, update the data plane. These are the Dapper sidecars deployed right alongside your app. Again, here are two examples of what an upgrade command would look like, whether you're using Dapper CLI or Helm. As you can see, the Dapper CLI is still only one line to upgrade the runtime version in a Kubernetes cluster, whereas the Helm command is a few more. Again, regardless of which method used, Dapper CLI or Helm, after the upgrade of the Dapper control plane, you will have to update the data plane which will upgrade the Dapper sidecars for your application. The Helm example shows a kube control rollout restart command to demonstrate this. What I'd like to do now is go into a demo of upgrading Dapper with truly zero downtime. Let's check it out. When running code in production, updating anything server side and customer facing can be a little daunting. It can be a little scary, right? Luckily with Dapper, when you have to update from one version of Dapper to the next, you can do so with zero downtime. Let's take a look. If we run a dapper status dash K command in our terminal, we can see in the version column we are currently using 1.4.0. I can also run a K get deploy command to see the deployments I currently have running in my production Kubernetes cluster in this particular namespace called Twitter sentiment. You can see we have three services running, each with three replicas, and then we have Zipkin, which is tracing given to us by default thanks to Dapper. 
We'll learn more about tracing later today. These three services all run a Twitter sentiment dapperized app, which ingests tweets based on a query string and then grades the sentiment using Azure Cognitive Services. Best of all, Dapper made wiring up the Twitter bindings and authentication super easy. But since this is a dapperized app and it is currently running in my production Kubernetes cluster, I need to be confident there will be zero downtime if I move from 1.4.0 to the current release of 1.4.2. Let's test this out. I'm gonna split my view here. And in the bottom pane, I'll run a watch command on the Dapper system namespace so we can watch the upgrade in real time. In the top pane, let's run the Dapper upgrade command. You'll notice I'm using dash K and that's because we're using Dapper with Kubernetes. I'll follow that up with the runtime version flag where I can specify a specific version I wanna to upgrade to. We're gonna move from 1.4.0 to 1.4.2, which is the latest version of Dapper as of this demo. I'll hit enter and that's it. Dapper will start upgrading the control plane and I'll bring up our Twitter sentiment app side by side so you can watch the upgrade happening in real time with zero downtime. Now, we do see some warnings here in the background that tells us there will be some changes to how Kubernetes handles pod disruption budgets in future releases of Kubernetes. Those are just informational messages, not error messages, so we can disregard and let Dapper complete the rolling upgrade. You will notice, though, as Dapper does its upgrade thing, we are still getting tweets. We're still able to grade the sentiment, and we can even take a quick look at Zipkin and run a query. Remember, Zipkin is provided to us with no extra effort thanks to Dapper. We can still do traces with Zipkin, despite Dapper's ongoing rolling upgrade in the background. We'll flip back over to our actual app and watch our tweets come in as the Dapper control plane continues to upgrade. And there we go. The Dapper control plane has been successfully upgraded to Dapper version 1.4.2, and the entire time the upgrade was happening, we didn't have any downtime for our application itself. Let's perform a quick sanity check to ensure we are now, for real, on the 1.4.2 version. We'll run Dapper status-k, and you can see in our version column, we now have updated to exactly what we'd expect, 1.4.2. Fantastic. All right. Now that we have covered installing and upgrading Dapper in production, let's move on to security. Dapper supports in-transit encryption of communication between Dapper instances using Sentry, a central certificate authority. Here's an example application with two services, Service A and Service B. Thanks to Dapper, all communication between Services A and B is done so securely using Mutual Authentication or MTLS. Dapper is implemented using the common sidecar pattern where a second process runs alongside our main process. The main application uses HTTP or gRPC requests to call into the Dapper sidecar to take advantage of the desired building block. And the sidecar instances securely communicate with one another, as we can see here. Now, why is this so important? I'm so glad you asked. MTLS offers a few key features for network traffic inside your application. First, it offers two-way authentication, the client proving its identity to the server and vice versa. And second, it offers an encrypted channel for all in-flight communication after two-way authentication is established. With Dapper, there isn't any extra work needed to get this up and running. Dapper includes an on-by-default automatic mutual TLS that provides this in-transit encryption for traffic between Dapper sidecars. It also manages workload and certificate rotation. It does so with zero downtime to the application. You can even bring your own certificates. If custom certificates have not been provided, no worries. Dapper will automatically create and persist self-signed certs valid for one year. In Kubernetes, the certs are persisted to a secret that resides in the namespace of the Dapper system pods, making it accessible only to them. This slide shows how the Sentry system service issues certificates for applications based on the root issuer certificate that is provided by an operator or generated by the Sentry service and stored as a Kubernetes secret object. MTLS settings for Dapper reside in a configuration file. Here you can see all the available settings for MTLS in a configuration resource object. By default, 
a workload cert is valid for 24 hours and the clock skew is set to 15 minutes, though you can change this as needed. What I'd like to do now is jump into a short demo where we show you how granular you can get with your MTLS settings configuration. Let's check it out. Do you like SSL? Would you say you love SSL? You should love SSL. SSL makes your life secure. I like SSL, but maintaining it can be an absolute pain. Maintaining SSL means ensuring your SSL does not expire and ensures it's properly implemented. Now, would you say you love mutual SSL? Probably not. It can be an even larger headache since mutual SSL, otherwise known as MTLS, doubles your burden because the same thing has to be implemented in two places. It's a mutual exchange between two services where both services are assured of the other's identity. Lucky for us, Dapper takes care of all of that by default. Dapper supports in-transit encryption of communication between Dapper instances using Sentry as your central certificate authority. If you'd like, you can bring your own certificates or allow Dapper to automatically create and persist self-signed root and issuer certs for you. To confirm MTLS is enabled on your Kubernetes cluster with Dapper support, simply run the Dapper MTLS-K command. You should see confirmation mutual TLS is enabled, which it should be unless you explicitly disabled it when initializing Dapper. MTLS settings reside in a Dapper configuration file, which in turn creates a Dapper configuration resource object. The default settings are 24 hours for clock skew and 15 minutes for time to live, but you can change those based on your needs or desires. Example, let's update ours here to five seconds for clock skew and 15 seconds for our time to live. This means Dapper will rotate our MTLS certificates every 15 seconds without any interaction from us as developers or operators. Now, of course, in production, you wouldn't want to edit any configuration on the production cluster. You'll define it in your infrastructure's code during deployment. But this is a demo to show you specifically how the certificate rotation works with Dapper. Any changes made to the Dapper control plane will require a restart to that control plane. We can do that using a rollout restart command. I'll do that here in my top pane and hit enter. In my bottom pane, I'll run a watch Dapper status command so we can see when everything is healthy again. Remember, as we saw in our zero downtime video, any changes made to our control plane will not affect our Dapperized apps running. Great. Now that the control plane has been restarted with the configuration changes, we'll stop the watch command and perform a rolling restart of our Twitter sentiment app so it can pick up the updated Dapper sidecars with the new configuration. We'll again do a watch command on this rolling update to ensure the restart is complete for our Twitter sentiment app. Excellent. Now let's take a look at the logs for any one of our services. I'll go ahead and choose viewer, for example, and I'll add the follow flag to the command so we can watch as the certs roll every 15 seconds. Again, this is all thanks to Dapper for making SSL easier than ever before. When properly configured, Dapper ensures secure communication. We've already touched on MTLS and we've seen it in action, but let's focus on some other settings a production-ready deployment should include. In addition to MTLS, there is app to dapper API authentication. This is the communication between your application and the Dapper sidecar. To secure the Dapper API from unauthorized access, you can enable Dapper's token-based authentication. Dapper uses JSON web tokens, or JWTs. In order to configure this, you would generate your token using any JWT token compatible tool and then create a secret object in Kubernetes with that token. Dapper will then leverage the secret store in Kubernetes to hold the token, which can then be referenced in your deployment using a simple annotation. In this example, the annotation is API token secret with a value of Dapper API token. Finally, there is Dapper to app API authentication, which is the communication between Dapper and your app. This ensures Dapper knows it's communicating with an authorized app. Similar to app to Dapper auth, this also uses a JWT token and again can be referenced using a simple annotation. Note, there are two annotation examples here. One is API token secret and the other is app token secret. To recap, App to Dapper Auth 
secures the Dapper API from unauthorized application access, whereas Dapper to App Auth ensures that Dapper knows it's communicating with an authorized application. A production-ready deployment should include both of these authentication configurations. Now let's talk about namespaces. When running Dapper in production, there are three primary factors to consider. First, the Dapper control plane should be installed in a dedicated Kubernetes namespace. By default, it's installed into the Dapper system namespace, so this works great. Second, while not a technically required practice, it's important to note Dapper supports scoping components for your apps. This can and should be enabled according to your security needs. You can see in the example under metadata, we have scoped the Redis state store component to the production namespace. An alternate example is if you're using Helm and you want to scope it to the release namespace for your Helm chart. Finally, you will want to consider your service invocation. When using service invocation with a dapperized app in a namespace, you will have to qualify it with that namespace. In this example, we're referencing the Zipkin endpoint address with a qualifying namespace depending on where the Zipkin tracing component has been deployed. If we use the production namespace we saw in the Redis component on our previous slide, this Zipkin address would read http zipkin.production.svc.cluster.local, etc. Moving on, let's also highlight secrets and how to securely consume secrets in production using Dapper. Secrets management gives us a consistent way to access connection strings, keys, passwords, and other sensitive information in our application. We've discussed the importance of considering namespaces when using Dapper in production. It's important to remember this when your components need to fetch secrets. When running in Kubernetes, Dapper, during installation, defines default role and role binding for secrets access from the Kubernetes secret store in the default namespace. For Dapper enabled apps that fetch secrets from the default namespace, a secret can be defined and referenced in components. However, in a production scenario, you will deploy your apps and Dapper components to non-default namespaces. If those Dapper enabled apps are using components that fetch secrets from non-default namespaces, for example, Twitter sentiment, which is the namespace we have used for our sample app, you'll need to configure the proper role and role binding for that namespace. This slide shows an example of the resource configuration. Note, two separate resource objects are being created. One is role, which is the secret reader. It is scoped to the secret resource with get and list permissions. The second is role binding, which is the dapper secret reader, scoped to a service account referencing the secret reader role. These resources grant Dapper permissions to get secrets from the Kubernetes secret store for the namespace defined in the role and role binding. While you have the option to use plain text secrets, like my password as shown in the YAML on the left for the value of the Redis password, this is not recommended for production. Dapper natively supports a wide variety of secret stores including Azure Key Vault, GCP Secret Manager, AWS Secrets Manager, HashiCorp Vault, and more. Components can reference secrets for the spec metadata section within the component's definition. In order to reference a secret, let's look at the example on the right. You need to set the auth secret store field to specify the name of the secret store that holds the secrets. But if that field is empty, that's okay. The default secret store will be used. Let's now jump into a short demo showing the proper way to configure secrets with Dapper. Let's talk about secrets. It's common for applications to store sensitive information, such as connection strings, keys, and tokens that are used to authenticate with databases, services, external systems, and APIs in secrets by using a dedicated secret store. Usually, this involves setting up a secret store, such as Azure Key Vault, HashiCorp Vault, or something similar, and then storing the application level secrets there. To access these secret stores, the application then needs to import the secret stores SDK. This may require a fair amount of boilerplate code that is not related to the actual business domain of the app, and so becomes an even greater challenge in multi-cloud scenarios where different vendor-specific secret stores may be used. This is where Dapper comes in. 
In an effort to make life easier for devs, Dapper has a dedicated secrets building block API that allows you to get secrets from a secret store. Take our Twitter sentiment app, for example. There are a lot of secrets we need to store for this app to work. Remove the vendor specific secrets like connection strings to storage accounts and Azure Cognitive Services. We need secrets to authenticate with the Twitter API. We connect our app to the Twitter API through a Twitter binding component where we pass four required secret parameters, our consumer key, consumer secret, access token, and access secret. We can take a look at how that binding is currently configured, where we have simply passed values to our deployment and then performed a base64 encryption on it. While this certainly works, it's not really secure and it doesn't utilize secret storage, which would be the appropriate way to address these secrets. To fix this, we can create a secret object in Kubernetes with this data. Again, still encrypted. This will now be backed by whichever secret storage you have configured Dapper to use. In this case, we are simply using the Kubernetes secret store. Once you define your secret object, you will then reference those values in your Dapper component. We can do that easily with our Twitter bindings component by referencing the secret we just created and then subsequently the key for each secret. I'm going to save this and let's redeploy our app. Great. Now that our app has been redeployed, we can again take a look at our Dapper tweets component. And this time we see our Twitter binding is using secrets stored in our secret storage instead of being passed directly. We can confirm the secret has been created by doing a K get secrets demo dash Twitter dash secret. That's what we named our secret object. And we see that secret has been created and contains four data entries aka our four secrets. For posterity, we can bring up our app and verify, yep, we are still able to connect to Twitter and thus ingest and grade the sentiment of tweets. Only this time, we're doing it the right way with security in mind. Thanks, Dapper. The last thing I wanna highlight is Dapper's tracing and metrics configuration. Observability gives us tracing across all the services in our application. With the Dapper, we can configure where we want the telemetry sent. This slide shows the same tracing information visualized from Azure Application Insights and Zipkin. Zipkin is a distributed tracing system. It helps gather timing data needed to troubleshoot latency problems in service architectures. Features include both the collection and lookup of this data. Best of all, Dapper supports Zipkin by default. This means that as a developer, we don't have to write any special code for this to work. Dapper also exposes a Prometheus metrics endpoint on port 9090 that you can scrape to gain a greater understanding of how Dapper is behaving and to set up alerts for specific conditions. You can view Dapper metrics using Azure Monitor, Grafana, New Relic, and as already mentioned, Prometheus. It is recommended that you set up distributed tracing and metrics for your applications and the Dapper control plane when using Dapper in production. However, if you prefer your own observability setup, you're welcome to use that as well. Phew, we have been on quite a ride today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. We've learned so much. Let's chat real quick about the resources you can use to get involved and continue your learning journey. The community momentum around Dapper is incredible. We released 1.0 in February, and it was submitted to the Cloud Native Cloud Computing Foundation in March. It's also great to see support from organizations around the world. Now, if you want to learn more about best practices, operations, security, and more, the best place to do so is our docs, available at docs.dapper.io. If you'd like to join the community, you can use any of these links to do so. You're also welcome to follow us on social media. And there's a great ebook available titled Dapper for .NET Developers. Again, Thank you so much for spending this time with me, and I can't wait to see you building incredible cloud native applications with Dapper. Have a wonderful time at DapperCon. Cheers, y'all.
Hey everyone, I am Donovan Brown and we are now in the adopter panel. So we're gonna be talking to people who have been adopting Dapper in production and running it already. This is gonna be a great opportunity for you to ask questions about what their experience was like when they went on this journey to adopt Dapper. So what I'd like to do now is give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves. We'll start with Russell and then we'll go around. Just tell us what company you're, you're with and, and your name and that'd be great. Hi everybody, I'm Russell Stather from Ignition Group. Uh, we're based down in South Africa. Very cool, Simon? Uh, Simon Jones, I'm the Head of Platform Engineering at Man Group, based in London, England. Very cool, Kai? So, Kai Walter, Carl Zeiss Group, uh, based in Germany. And then Stefan? Uh, my name is Stefan Jäger, I'm with Bosch, and I'm also sitting in Germany. Very cool. I was actually born in Germany, in Frankfurt, so I, I, I love going there and having a good time and, and, and hanging out. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and play favorites, and I'm going to start with the people from Germany since I was born there. I want to start with Stefan and say, tell me about your experience of adopting Dapper. Like, What was it that drew you to Dapper, and how have you been able to use it in your applications? And I'm going to ask everyone this question around mm -hmm. the panel. Okay. So um, actually, we jumped on Dapper like Quite early, I think it was uh, 0.3, the version that we jumped on. And um, what brought us to Dapper was like a Microsoft um, solution architect that um, we were in discussion with in regards to having a distributed system and uh, adopting an event-driven architecture. And this is where we also learned how Dapper could help us uh, on that journey. And um, yeah, we had regular sessions out with the Dapper guys. Uh, trying to shape a little bit what the PubSub component is doing. And um, I think we learned from each other quite a bit. And um, this year we uh, went live with our application and with Dapper 1.0 and have been yeah uh, updating since. And, oh, very, uh, very yeah. cool. Awesome. Uh, Kai, how's your experience been and what kind of drove you towards Dapper as well? So we basically started off last year in spring. Um, we wanted to replace a uh, auto processing system which is based on a monolithic uh, system architecture and bring it into a globally distributed uh, microservice architecture uh, also with a redundancy uh, um, in, uh, designed in um, so we knew of, um, that we need to need to support various uh, processing steps in in auto processing uh, in synchronous and in asynchronous so we knew okay we had to support uh, pops up and uh, service invocations. We knew that we had to keep uh, auto processing state um, concurrent uh, around the world. Um, uh, we knew that although the majority of, of the system will be done in .NET, we knew that we uh, had to incorporate uh, other languages like Java. And uh, around the time from previous engagements, uh, I was contacted by Mark Fussell. Um, uh, we got to learn uh, the Dapper team um, and uh, saw their uh, saw their engagement, uh, saw their uh, commitment, and uh, started a journey. And we also went live or in production with uh, Dapper GA, and also we are updating since and uh, um, running the the application in production. Awesome. So we're going to come back and double click on some of that. But before we do, Simon, I was really glad when I saw your session because you're not using Dapper like everyone else. Like or I would say that that everyone else traditionally thinks that they're supposed to use Dapper. You're using it on VM. So can you tell me a little bit more about how you adopted Dapper and what, what your motivations were? Yeah, so um, we've got a proprietary trading operations platform that's primarily written in .NET and it's consisting of many individual services, but we've developed and maintained this over many years. And we incrementally improve it to maintain the existing investment. And it's a, as a result, it's a wide range of framework versions, languages, technologies, um, whether it's .NET, but other teams developing in Java and Python that interact with it. But it is primarily hosted on VMs. We deploy the services as Windows services, example, in many cases. Um, and we're always looking for ways to incrementally add features across the whole thing that are compatible with all of that. And we actually came across Dapper, I think it was during Mark Rosinovich's talk at Ignite in 2019, was it? November 2019? And what drew us to Dapper was it's a consistent way of adding features to all of those services because it uses the HTTP and GRPC interface and is written in Go and it's cross-platform. So we could add service discovery to everything, uh, eliminating the need for DNS aliases, distributed telemetry, the encrypted communications, the 
HTTP and gRPC calls with OAuth support, you know, a forward-thinking communication technology, and even application features that we don't currently have, like virtual actors across the primary languages we use, Java, Python, .NET. And then there's all the other things that it adds, like pub, sub, state management, things that we've yet to leverage, but we know that by using Dapper, we'll have a consistent platform that we can use to add features now in the, for things that are a bit older and everything going into the, into the future. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we're going to come back and talk about that incremental adoption, what it seems like you're, you're, you're alluding to a little bit, which I really like. But before we do that, Russell, uh, give us a little bit of background on your adoption of Dapper and what kind of drew you to it and, and how it's been helping you. So um, we, we, again, we started with Dapper very early in the process. Um, we actually worked with um, the Mark and Yaron's team in Redmond, and very early on, we contributed one of the um, the bindings because we were connecting to Azure storage queues, um, cool. and we needed that, so we added that code. Um, we, we were driven to use that because we were looking for something that was very, very scalable. Um, we were looking at using Kubernetes, and there was lots of really neat features that we liked in there, particularly around service discovery by convention. Um, we, the system we were building, we were looking at very lumpy workloads that we we, we knew we'd have to scale. So we we've one of the applications we've built is is a billing platform, and the the invoice runs we need to scale up from one service most of the month to like you know twenty services on the on the invoicing day and that kind of thing. And and it and it fitted in very nicely. Um, we also were migrating away from a quite an old monolithic application. And we were looking for something that we could kind of surgically modify parts of the solution um, just by redeploying very small services. So in our production cluster now, which we've had going for about, I don't know, 12 months, I guess, um, because we, we went into production with like version 0.3 or 0.4 or something. Um, and we, we've got about 100 services running in that now um, uh, managing this platform. And, and the ability to, to deploy one, to do an upgrade, is really key to where we're driving the systems. Awesome. So yeah, I, I, there's a couple things I want to double click on, but we're already getting questions from the, the audience that's watching live. Kendall asked, uh, and it's a really good question, and I, I, this is for everyone on the panel, and feel free to double click on this, but the question is, what has been the biz biggest technical challenges that you faced as you adopted Dapper? Uh, so I think that's a really, this gives them the real world, like this is what you can expect if you were to go through this journey. So anyone feel free to share if there were any technical difficulties and how you overcame those um, to use Dapper. Who'd like to go first? Yeah, maybe I can go first. Like sure. uh, we, we, we jumped on it like quite early and I think in the early days it was like tight coupling still with the SDKs and the runtime version. So we, we struggled there, uh, but these were like the pre GA days. So these topics are gone uh, once we, we reach GA and uh, we now have uh, backwards compatibility when it comes to SDK and the runtime. Um, I think like Dapper is pretty agnostic for the PubSub topic. Nevertheless, I think it's more or less um, a, a mindset topic to come into the event driven uh, topic. So it's not even a adapter topic, but you have to to, to adapt your, your coding style and your mindset and your design to really adopt uh, event driven. And then the other topic, uh, what we also adopt is like the virtual actors. And this is like similar, uh, like it's uh, not to blame adapter, but it's, uh, it's also concept. It, it's a different concept and you have, have to get used to it. And um, that's, it's not easy. And um, yeah, so it's nothing to blame on Dapper here. It's that the, the usual complexity that you have when you in IT projects. Yeah, when you're trying to do microservices, I, I know I had experienced this as well, is that there's this bit of intimidation on all the things that you don't know that you don't know yet, right? How do I do service-to-service mm, yeah, yeah. service invocation? How do I make sure that these are all scalable? How do I do PubSub? And do, do I have to pick a particular broker? Right? Do I have to go ahead and bet all of my chips on RabbitMQ or can I switch over to Service Bus? And what Dapper did for me was just like, ah, Donovan, stop worrying about that stuff, right? Because we're going to take care of all that for you. Just go have an amazing F5 experience on your dev machine, use whatever's closest to you, and then we're going to make sure that that continues to work for you in production. So as you pointed out, actors, it's just a weird concept if you've never used it before. And you kind of got to wrap your head around when should I use this? And we provide that for you in any language if you want it. So mm -hmm. I think it's really nice for you to dis distinguish between what was truly 
a technical barrier for dapper adoption where there really hasn't been many, especially since it's GA versus just wrapping your head around distributed application development and those challenges that are innate there as well. So does anyone else want to double click on any of the technical challenges you might have had when you yeah. first started adopting it? So for us, it was the global distribution because back at that time, there um, was no concept for that in Dapper. So basically, we had uh, clusters around the world on, on, on several, uh, several geos. And uh, to, to reach global distribution, we had to loop back to a globally distributed API management instance. So when, whenever we wanted to shift workload to another region, we basically loop, uh, looped over API management. So this was uh, something uh, uh, that has to be solved. And uh, then the other thing, uh, back then, Dapper, the only suitable uh, hosting option for it was Kubernetes. And mm. so we had to bring up uh, uh, the team to, to Kubernetes speed. Yeah, we did not use it in, in that stretch so far. So that was also a, a, a challenge to go along. But it's not directly related to Dapper, but we had to deal with it. Yeah, and that's another thing that I loved so much about Simon joining the panel as well, is that it kind of breaks that that misnomer or that that misinformation that you have to be containerized, you have to be running inside of Kubernetes. None of that is true. Like you can run Dapper on prem, you can run it on VMs, you can run it on the edge. Dapper has no dependency on containers or Kubernetes in any way, shape, or form. But it works just as well there as it does everywhere else, which I think is a really good point that I hope everyone takes away from DapperCon is that Dapper is awesome, regardless of what language you program in or what platform you target, it's simply going to make your life easier when you go forward. So Simon or Russell, did you have anything else to add to that? Uh, sure, I, I can mean, add to that quickly, not, actually. Um, <laughs> we'll go, we'll go with, we'll go with uh, Simon first, and then we'll get to Russell. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I was just following on kind of what you said there is that um, for, for Dapper, the, the biggest challenge for us initially, because we had a very targeted set of things we were looking at, we wanted service discovery, we wanted uh, the distributed telemetry, but we also wanted a seamless development environment, a seamless experience for the developers. We wanted our .NET developers to literally just run Visual Studio like they always do and to Dapper seamlessly come up in the background as an executable that's managed almost like a DL. They shouldn't even know it's there half right. the time. You know, that's a deployment challenge. Right. Um, and so that's why we we spent again with some of the early versions, not quite as early as some of you guys. It's like you guys have been at it from the beginning with like deploying it. But once it became suitably stable from our point of view, then we started looking at all the command line options that Dapper D itself, the daemon used under the hood, and learned how to launch that outside of the CLR, outside of a pod. And that's why we created the sidekick component that we open sourced. And with that, our developers can literally just run Visual Studio now, and we will bootstrap and configure and launch Dapper and manage its health under the hood. And that eliminated the main barrier for adoption for us outside of Kubernetes. And it's a seamless experience now. Awesome. It's, uh, it's, it's a great tool. Awesome. Dapper as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Dapper. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But before we do that, Russell, what did you want to add? So yeah, I mean, one one of the initial issues we had was actually getting developers' heads around microservices and how they yeah. did the debugging. And um, initially, we we span up a a micro Kubernetes cluster for each of them, and they were playing around in there. And there was obviously there was an issue with we're a .NET shop, and there's a lot of boilerplate to to build around it. So um, the first things about the debugging we kind of solved by uh, once people had a bit of experience of it, they just tested at the service level. So we no longer needed kind of to to run three or four or five or six services on your machine. However, people just work on a single service, deploy it into the test cluster, and you're kind of up and running. And we only have one test cluster now between a whole bunch of developers, and that worked pretty really well. Then the other thing we found with the .NET development was building up all the boilerplate necessary um, to, to build a microservice in terms of connecting to um, Azure configuration and different connections things to test and production DBs and all that kind of stuff. And we and we solved that by building a Visual Studio plugin, um, which is available on the marketplace. And you just click on that and it generates you the entire microservice, including all the YAML files and all the Azure pipelines in one go. And so you can click on a button, generate a service and deploy it. Um, and you're done. And that really reduced the friction of the development times. Yeah, fantastic. And and I I, I talk to people about that all the time. It I, I focus so much being a developer for so long is that I, I need that F5 experience to be like as low friction as possible. I, I don't want to know anything about Kubernetes if I don't want to. We all know we have to run there eventually, but none of us actually wants to touch it. Like none of us actually want to have one running on our machines. And Dapper gives you that level of abstraction that lets me just run it locally 
with a confidence that it'll run just as well when I containerize it and run inside of Kubernetes, which I think is is my fa one of my favorite features about it. And I, I want to double click on something that Simon said. Like you, what was it about Dapper that made you say, I want to go make the investment into Sidekick, right? Because you could have looked at it and said, you know what? Like we can find other ways to solve these problems. There were other ways to solve this problem, but what was it about Dapper that drew you to it and said, no, 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 like this is the answer that we need. So I'm going to go invest in Sidekick to make it easier for my .NET developers. Yeah, it's interesting. There are other solutions out there for doing some of the things that Dapper does. Mm -hmm. um, and you could look at multiple different components that might do similar things, whether it's service discovery or acting as an L an L7 proxy or something like that. And if you looked at the time we were looking at Dapper, certainly there was there was nothing on the Windows platform necessarily uh, that would give you the same sort of service discovery and distributed telemetry and everything in one component. It's just one unit that has everything in it. And it's just one thing you have to deploy. Because bear in mind, we're not into Kubernetes, we're not in pods. So we're going to limit the number of things we have to deploy along with everything else to minimize the number of components we share. Um, Dapper gave us this really nice abstraction layer between and all these different things it might add in the future where we just got a, a unified, consistent interface that we talk through over HTTP or gRPC. And we can swap out certain things. So whether we're in debug mode look, on a local machine, we can have a local environment with local components running on there in containers. Then we can deploy it with a different YAML and point to production systems on the various environments. And it's just a configuration change, but we're only deploying one sidecar. And it doesn't, yes. we can have MTLS running locally, but not anywhere else. And because of the way we did it with Sidekick, then it's, it's just all packaged up and run in the same way. And all we have to do is change configuration. So when you look at the number of different things that we're running it across, the number of technologies and languages and platforms and historical stuff, it's, uh, I, I think, and with the virtual active technology as well, across those, the main programming languages we use, I think it's quite a unique proposition. Great. And I also noticed that listening to everyone speak, no one appears to be using all of it. And, and I, want, I want everyone that's watching this to understand that you don't have to, right? If, if all you need is PubSub, uh, trust me, we're gonna make that easier to use than if you were to go take a hard dependency on any particular backing service, right? If you only need state management, it's still gonna be easier to solve it with Dapper than to take a hard dependency on a particular API or a particular cloud vendor. It being agnostic, and there's a repo I'll share afterwards where I do demos very similar to what you were talking about, Simon, that prove that I can go from AWS to Azure to local, right? And all I change is configuration and not a single line of code changes and it all just works. And that value proposition with so many customers being multi-cloud, uh, with so many customers wanting to run the same workload on the edge as they run in the cloud, like that abstraction to me is just like that, that that's magic sauce that makes Dapper so powerful. So for the rest of you, like Kai, for example, what was that initial feature or that initial thing that got you so early on? Because it sounds like you've been with Dapper from the very beginning when it didn't do all the crazy stuff that it does now. What was it that drew you to Dapper the first time? So as I said, uh, the, the way I could mix uh, asynchronous and synchronous processing, meaning pops up and um, method invoca invocation with the same code base, uh, with the same inputs, with the same outputs, not changing code, just changing the way um, way of invoca invocation was very good. And then, but it turned out very, very soon that actors is the key that we need. Yeah? Because we had some certain states like uh, if you think about the order processing system, we have to give a globally unique order number. Yeah, Each order needs to have a globally unique numerical order number. So no GUID uh, stuff uh, doesn't count. And so we had to find a concept where we basically share number ranges across the world and keep state on those number ranges. And there the combination of uh, actor state and the Cosmos DB helped us really to solve this, this puzzle uh, very easily. And what I wanted to touch on also, um, uh, coming back to the developer experience, the developers on their own machines, they could use simple services like Redis for pops up and mm -hmm. state and whatever. Yeah? But when deploying, we just changed the configuration and uh, we went with the cloud services like Azure Service Bus or Cosmos DB. Yeah? So same coding, no changes, just uh, just the change of the, the configuration. Awesome. So we had another really good question from the people who are watching live. So keep your questions coming. We're actually trying to get to as many of those questions as we can. The question comes from Harry and the question is, which, what is the biggest capability that you would like to see in the future? So now that you've been running Dapper for a while and, you, and you've been solving real world problems and running it in production, what is a capability that you would like to see added to Dapper that you think would 
be a good addition. So, so for us, clearly, one of the big problems we have is scalability. And if there were some kind of generic patterns that were available in the infrastructure to do kind of auto scaling, so you could designate a, um, a particular service um, as one that could be scaled out horizontally um, across the cluster without really having to get into any deep knowledge of how Kubernetes ah, works. So if that I was see. kind of kind of built into the, um, the the Dapper annotations even, so that when you deployed it things, that the um, Dapper would do the right thing and, and have some scalability pattern built in there for you, that kind of stuff would be great. Because one, one of the things we do is we, we now have a, a pattern of a, of a master service. And if it's doing lots of processing, it's, it's instead of doing the processing itself, it sends the message to a queue, and then we spin up a whole batch of kind of other services that read off that queue, so we get 20 of things processing it. And I think it's those kinds of those kinds of patterns we would like to see kind of off the shelf. So that, again, we don't have to write that code, and it's part of the framework that would make the um, you know the dev's life a lot easier and make the whole thing more consistently manageable. Because then you get standard telemetry and all that kind of stuff about it. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that we all know we're eventually going to be in Kubernetes, but none of us want to actually touch it, right? So you're wanting yeah, us to give you yeah. a level of abstraction that says, hey, yes. go tell Kubernetes how to scale this thing. Kata might be another project that actually came from incubations as well that you might want to look at because it's an okay. event-based auto scaler that could look at that queue and automatically scale that out for you. And because we're already going to inject all the sidecars for you automatically, like that would kind of start to happen, right? So uh, look up Kata when, when we're done. But it looked like some other people kind of got excited about that question too who wanted to yeah. comment. Yeah, uh, may I? Okay. Yeah, please. So, uh, what uh, one of the nice things with Dapper is really that you only take a dependency on one framework. So, for PubSub, uh, for state, for actors, for uh, method invocation, for secrets, for telemetry, you take a dependency on, on, on one framework. Yeah. And the only thing what is currently missing for us is app configuration. So, we're participating in all those uh, discussions, but what we want to have also abstracted in Dapper is app configuration so that we can also run feature flags and stuff over Dapper yeah. and also be cloud agnostic uh, with, with this uh, aspect of uh, uh, application. Fantastic. That, that would be nice, I think, yeah. Mm. Anything else you wanted to add to that, Stefan? Or is that? Uh, yeah, I think we also had some uh, discussions about like blue green deployments, but on uh, AKS level, like on cluster level. Um, but yeah. Could, could yeah, at, at some yeah. at some point, I, I wonder like we can't have it fix everything. Like there's yeah, yeah. <laughs> some no, I'll add to that as well though, because I was going to say the same thing that traffic shaping because it's acting as an L7 proxy, then traffic shaping, especially when you got like multiple services, you might want to have a way of directing your traffic to one thing. And bear in mind, we're running outside of Kubernetes. We don't have an Istio or something like that, or, or an Envoy. So being able to say, I want to direct traffic to a certain instance to do a blue-green type deployment, I think that's an excellent point. And there's an extension of that as well, and that is if you're doing development of a service and you want to debug into a cluster that's got everything running in one place that's already deployed, it'd be great if you could start up a Dapper instance and you could somehow direct, let's say you've got 10 instances of a service and you're debugging just locally and you want to start an instance of direct traffic just to that one rather than console balancing it across all 10 instances automatically through service discovery. It'd be great if there's a way you could put something in the headers in the traffic that's coming out from one service saying, I want you to go, please, when you go to Dapper and Dapper interprets saying, I want you to go to this machine. So you receive specifically that traffic you want to debug as part of the testing. At the moment, you've got to hit like a service like 10 times to get one message completed. You've got 10 deployed and you're running an instance yourself outside of it. So it's easy to start Dapper to connect to a secure cluster and actually with, with the right credentials so you can receive traffic. But having to wait many times depending on how many services you've got deployed. It'd be great if you do things like that. But again, this is all about traffic shaping. I think that's something that would be really awesome if we get something like that into Dapper. Very, very cool. So uh, Russell mentioned something about scale, but Stefan, you, you're you running Dapper at, at massive scale at Bosch. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're doing some of the scaling work that you're doing with Dapper and, and what, you're at, what your solution looks like when, from a scale perspective? Um, yeah, I think actually, uh, like similar to the session we just saw, like we're following like the Dapper recommendations for HA setup, and it's uh, this is working fine for us, like for the for the runtime components, and um, all the other all the other things are then um, again like uh, traffic dependent, so um, we have auto scaling in place, and uh, I think we don't run into issues when it comes to our um, sidecars. I think that's gotcha. uh, that's fine. 
So I wanted to go talk to Simon for a second because you're in a kind of regulated industry. Um, so was there any challenges being able to use Dapper in a regulated industry or has it actually been uh, pretty smooth sailing and, and something you were able to do? Um, I think the main thing that in, a, in our industry is we tend to move quite slowly and cautiously. So the platform that we have, because it's been developed over time so much, it's one large platform with a number of interconnected services. As we're regulated, then we have to um, we have to we have to trade and report transactions in a very timely way. There's a certain time limit you have when you have to report things. Otherwise, um, you know, you breach regulations in that industry. And we can't afford for any of our services to become unstable for even the shortest period of time. So we're very cautious about what we what we deploy. Um, and as a result, you know, with Dapper, if anything, we're actually just taking our time with it. We're not rushing. So we haven't had too many problems using it in our regulated environment yet because we are taking a cautious approach to, to rolling it out, shall we say. Um, the one thing I'll say is that the great thing about Dapper, though, is we can add it, all of our services independently with virtually no impact on those services. We can just route traffic through it. We deploy it along with it. It's the lack of risk of using something like Dapper rather than um, changing your service to modify its logic or to add other third-party libraries into it. Uh, that is one of the most attractive features from that point of view. No, for sure. Um, Russell, I saw you nodding in, nodding in agreement. Are you faced with some of those similar challenges or was your experience slightly different? Um, no, it's slightly different, but one of the things that, that we have in terms of a challenge is that we we want to add, if you like, new aspects to our application. And historically, that's always been done by configuration. So, um, and you get these dependencies between the components. And uh, we, we quickly realized that using the, the, the very straightforward service discovery in Dapper, you're just changing a URL, um, we named the components with the name that the, the upstream one wanted to find. And so it dynamically builds the target. So um, that way we, we can add in new functionality by deploying a microservice with the right name without changing any of the upstream components. So again, it means it's a very safe way of doing modifications to the entire system because it's kind of, you don't do any harm. You put in a new, um, you put in a new service, it's completely independent, and then you introduce the name of it way upstream, and the, the data just flows down, and the service that wants to find it goes, I want to speak to you, and, and it sends the data across, and it all just works without having to have this configuration, that configura configuration, you make sure you've got the right version of all the services. We just don't get that issue anymore. So it becomes a very safe environment to deploy new services into. Yeah, that's One of the neat features okay, actually you guys have done recently on that is that the change to bring over the feature from the gRPC proxying, so the HTTP URL now doesn't have v1 slash method slash all of that stuff in it. You can just use exactly the same and just change the DNS alias. Uh, it's such a thing like that. that was, that's a real benefit. No, I completely agree. And um, yeah, I completely agree on that. It, it's, 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 it's just making it easier and easier. I think the more experience we get having customers like yourself use it in production is kind of driving the way that we're going to be modifying it and making sure that it meets the needs of our customers who who are running there and in production. And one of the things you kind of reminded me of, Russell, when you were talking about the configuration, and this is something I didn't know when I first started using Dapper, is that you can actually configure multiple of the same component. So I can have five different state stores all pointing at something different. So if I wanted to adopt a new state store, it doesn't mean I have to tell all my existing services, you all now have to switch over to this new state store. I can literally just drop another component with a different name configured to a different state store and have certain services just use that one as we slowly start to adopt across. So I think that's something that for some reason just didn't pop to me when I first started using Dapper, but it's really cool to know that you can have four different pub subs, and you can have four different state stores, and you can have whatever it is that you're defining, you can define multiple of those, and then actually have your code choose which one, it, what path it's gonna take through your through your configuration, which is fantastic. And being a DevOps guy, I love configuration, because I can manipulate that as I go through the pipeline, right? Nothing's hard coded, no code needs to change, but I can have my configuration for dev be different than it is for QA, using the exact same backing services, but where they point could be drastically different, which is a really powerful uh, concept for us as well. So Kai, I see you you nodding your head there when we're talking about DevOps and running things through the process. Have you been using that same type of 
capability of modifying your configuration through your pipeline as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we have four stages and we run it uh, through DevOps. Um, although the, 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 the resource profile is the same on all four stages. So if we go into the cloud, we always use the same cloud uh, resources, uh, of course. Only We only have a variance to the dev machine, yeah? Um, yes. But, um, we, we, uh, in the cloud, we use the same profile of resources. Yeah, very good. And I'd like to also, I'm, I'm one of those guys, if I'm going to be running in Kubernetes on, on the cloud, I, I tend to want to run Kubernetes at least as close to me as I can. I want to shift that left. And what I like about Dapper is that I can run it locally, or I can still containerize it and still run it inside of Kubernetes on my machine itself. And things like Bridge to Kubernetes uh, almost does what you wanted to do, Simon, right? Where you can actually say, hey, Bridge, I only want you to debug this one service that I have the source code for. I don't have the source code for any of the other five services that are running. And then what you can do is have Bridge connect to your Kubernetes cluster and route all of that traffic so that you're hitting breakpoints in your code while the other services are running happily inside of Kubernetes have no idea that you're actually debugging it live, which is cool. So the way that you can actually integrate some of the other tools, I, I mentioned Kata as well, Bridge to Kubernetes is another good one that works really well with Dapper, to where debugging your Dapperized application doesn't feel different than debugging a, a .NET new application because we have the Dapper extension that allows you to just add debug configurations to Visual Studio Code. And then we have Bridge to Kubernetes, which you might have seen a demo at KubeCon that Jessica Dean did, where it shows how she can literally just, it, it's the great analogy of taking your computer and just sticking it inside the cluster, right? Because like you're, you're now a component there and you're able to debug first class. And what I really like is how the community keeps adding this value to Dapper to where I don't feel like I'm doing anything special. I, I'm, I'm just getting all this value in the same experience that I had before. Have, how have your developers inside your organizations taken to Dapper? Have there been any any pushback to adopting Dapper that you had to overcome? I would say from our point of view, the, the whole sidecar idea is kind of new. Um, having an external process that you have to kind of bootstrap along with. I mean, under .NET, developers used to DLL sitting there, and sure. they're seamless. You just add a package reference, and away you go, and you don't even think about it. But a whole separate executable that has to be managed alongside your existing process, that is a... Uh, there was a sense of nervousness about that initially. Um, one of the development teams recently, though, just had a go at using what we developed as a combination of Sidekick and Dapper together. And I think they found it was a fairly seamless experience overall. So it's a case of getting that getting that sort of knowledge uh, just distributed more, you know, through training and, and getting other people to use it. Um, overall, I think certainly from our point of view, the way we've come up with it is pretty frictionless, I think, um, now. But uh, certainly that initial whole sidecar mentality, especially if it's not in a pod and managed for you, um, is something that certainly concerns some people. Or did. It, it's, it seems to be a, a reoccurring theme that Dapper isn't the problem. Right? It, it's mm. distributed application development. It's microservice application development. Getting your because the sidecar pattern isn't something that we invented, right? The sidecar yeah. pattern is a very common pattern. But had you not worked inside of Kubernetes before, you may have never heard of this thing before, and it becomes very foreign to think about why do I have two processes running when all I want to do is run my application. But I think once we're able to all wrap our heads around these these paradigm shifts, we start to really see the value that Dapper adds because. We're not adding anything that you didn't already have already. We're just adding more value into that sidecar than it was there before. Yeah, I, I think uh, one challenge was uh, we brought in developers with various backgrounds, so uh, backgrounds with other uh, actor frameworks, uh, backgrounds like Azure Functions. Yeah, and as you said, you have to get your uh, head around it and to to do it the dapper way. Yeah, because in the beginning you tried the old way and try to somehow uh, squeeze dapper to the old way, but that does not work. You really have to give in and just uh, leave it up to the framework. Yeah, do it. Start as simple as possible. Yeah, the framework really takes over uh, all those responsibilities and then build up from there. Yeah, I agree. I love this. Start simple. And again, it goes back to the fact that none of you are using all of it. And I cannot stress enough that you don't have to. Just use um, the part of Dapper that adds value. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, one, one thing I wanted to mention is like um, the uh, the Dapper promise is like um, yeah, you don't have to care about the infrastructure or uh, yeah, it's an abstraction layer also for the pub sub and for the state management. But um, yeah, also what what like uh, resonates or what what we get back from the developers is like. Um, Nevertheless, you have to care about the underlying infrastructure because, mm. like, there's the nitty-gritty details that um, 
um, you actually have to know if you want to uh, set up a proper um, Azure service bus, you have to think about like that letter queues and subscriptions and and retries. And then when it comes to state management, you have to think, think about um, uh, sharding of the database and stuff like that. So from, from a, like a pure developer's perspective, it's easy because like I talk HTTP to, to the sidecar and it's done, but like from an end to end, -to -end perspective, like somebody has to care that um, it's actually working as expected. And um, so I think the, the promise is kind of fair, but you also have to look under the cover and you have, um, have to be aware that uh, there's some, some, some knobs you have to, to twist to actually get it somehow production ready. So, so one one of the things that I'm I still want to try with Dapper is the is the idea of um, kind of dynamic configuration at runtime using the the bindings, um, so that you can you can have a um, a service or a bunch of services that all do something independently. And, and where I want to really do this is is our machine learning environment, where you're you're taking data from one service and sending it to another one. Um, but the interface between them is just a queue, and you, you use the Dapper bindings to kind of do that at runtime. And, and now we've got Dapper into separate, namesp separate namespaces. I can go and deploy these six services into that namespace, join them together with the bindings, and have the data flow all the way through. Um, but um, I'm getting a certain amount of, um, are you crazy from some of the developers <laughs> when I talk about it, because they're like, well, <laughs> You can't do that. We can't test it before you deploy it. There, you know? So it's, but I think those sort of things make sort of um, a really super configurable system. And it's just something you really couldn't do without this kind of framework in place. So I'll just add, actually, Jonathan, if I can, that I think, if anything, DAP has simplified things for us. So we were originally looking at, at the time when that Ignite conference came out, when DAP was announced, we were looking at Service Fabric at the time. That was one of the things that we were considering. And we'd done some tests with it, and we liked the UI, and we liked all the failover and that sort of thing. But we were concerned that it's such a large, opinionated framework from our point of view for the few features that we wanted from it. Um, and we're concerned about doing upgrades and you know and that sort of thing and keeping it all stable. Um, and DAP has just eliminated the need for Service Fabric entirely, and we can do it all with independent sidecars. We've got our own placement at Sentry clusters, which are easy to set up and maintain, and it's massively simplified both the control and the data plane from our point of view. That's awesome. So I agree, I agree, Simon. Yeah, so we've actually had a large Service Fabric cluster at the, at the moment, and we're busy migrating all that off into DAP mm. at the moment, and we're actually using a lot less resources. The deployments are much easier and more reliable, actually, because you do it service by service. Um, and you don't have that encumbrance of the kind of the service fabric. You will do it my way or no way, kind of. Uh, yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've gotten I've gotten Dapper to run inside of uh, service fabric, too. So if you need to do that slow drip, you need to like kind of show them how cool this is. You can actually do things like secrets management and pub sub by just firing up the sidecar as a guest proc, and then it just works, right? So it's kind of cool so that you can kind of have them dip their toe into the dapper waters and realize how great it is, and then just come yank them out of there once they realize how awesome it is to use dapper instead. Because like you said, easy is the best thing. When I first got introduced to dapper, I kind of looked at it sideways, like, yeah, you can't do all that stuff, you promise. Like, there's no way it's this good. And then I wrote a component for it and realized, holy macro, like, this stuff is really abstracted to a level to where it really makes my life easier. But I always look at it from the developer perspective. I want to go back to what something Stefan said, where there's there's more than just a developer involved in shipping software. But what I've noticed is that that religious battle we used to have with the operations team trying to tell me how it had to be done, which made my life as a developer hard because I had to then replicate that type of infrastructure on my dev, dev machine to have any chance of developing against it. Like we would have these really horrible meetings me pushing back because I can't duplicate that. How am I supposed to verify my code? And Dapper, again, kind of stands between the two of us and said, hey, operations team, go do the right thing in production, right? Go figure out what the sharding should be. Go figure out how to deploy that infrastructure correctly. Make sure you're doing what's best to scale your architecture. Donovan, relax, right? Just like, go program against this ab ab abstraction, and I promise it'll work over here. So it's, it's kind of stopped all that friction that we were having when we're having these really big battles on well, I need you to do it this way in production because I can't do it this way in development. And now it's like, don't worry about that. Do the right thing on both sides. Have a great F5 experience. 
have the right secure, structured, scalable, resilient infrastructure. And then we're just going to sit in between and make sure that this stuff continues to work. And it's been proving that true and true. And I love, again, talking to you all is very special because we're talking to people who have actually been running this stuff and of adopting this and living what we're preaching and can confirm that what we're saying isn't just hype. This is actual real and you're putting it in production. So I really do appreciate that. We have about five minutes left. Is there anything that you'd like people to know about your journey with, with Dapper that we haven't covered yet? Well, for me, we obviously we got involved quite early on, but the guys in the Dapper team have been just super helpful. Um, whenever we've had any issues, they've been right on the top. Um, I mean, with some of the releases, which obviously it was it was alpha, right? So there was a bit of flakiness here and there, but they they jumped right onto our cluster. They logged in and and helped us sort things out. And so that that really gave us a lot of confidence that it was going to end up being a um, a super resilient framework once they got it to GA, and, and it definitely has. I mean, we we've we've had no issues really, yeah, you know, since like Dapper 0.7 or eight. Um, awesome. um, we've been running quite happily, and it's it's uh, probably the, the the best bit of our infrastructure that we've got in terms of resiliency and the amount of stuff that you don't have to do to look after it. That's yeah. fantastic. I, I can I'll also say the same thing actually on the open source side of things. So when we when we were working with Dapper and we realized we wanted a service discovery component that wasn't part of Kubernetes, the 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 way that we were able to work with the Dapper team to develop the console component that we contributed and then also the um the psychic component we contributed ourselves. I mean man, man is very much in the open source world anyway. We contribute quite a lot, but this in, in our division, this is one of the first times that we'd actually done this way. And it was the Dapper team made it really easy, really easy to, to develop and contribute the console component and work with them and invited us to do the community call for Psychic and that sort of thing. So it's been a great collaboration. Fantastic. Kai, you were going to say something as well. Yeah. So I just wanted to highlight that the, the, the commitment the team showed, the Dapper team showed, really helped us gaining trust in, in the framework and also our journey. And I remember this meeting when we had a small issue yeah, when uh, Jaroon was even... He was tracking down the issue during our meeting, during the phone call, 30 minutes, and even pull requesting it on the go. Yeah? And it uh, was really uh, a nice way of, of collaborating. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Stefan? I, yeah. yeah. All has been said, I think, like Arthur and Jaron, and uh, really, they're very supportive and uh, up for calls, also looking into our clusters, uh, responsive on the GitHub tickets, um, approachable via Discord. like. What you would expect, yeah. It's or That's it's right. more actually, it's more than you would expect. So, so it's That's really fantastic. Cool. Yeah, the Discord channel, for those who don't know, is a fantastic way to go get your questions answered. It's just a, a, a group of people who are just geeking out and really like this product, and you're getting answers not only from the uh, the maintainers, but you're getting answers from fellow community members who just really like this and have already seen and solved that particular problem. So, I encourage you if you're not already. A uh, part of that community to definitely join the Dapper Discord. And the Discord is also set up during DapperCon to have a different channel for each one of the sessions that we've had today. So if you have additional questions that you'd like us to pose to some of our panelists, if you have questions for Cecil, Jessica, or some of the different case studies that we're going to be doing today, you can go over to our Discord channel. And in there will be a channel for each one of these sessions where you can add additional questions. And we'll make sure we have some moderators and some community members in there who can help you address some of those questions in our Discord. Now, I also wanted to just thank the panel so much. Uh, it was really interesting. And it's always fun to, to listen to people who have actually using a product that you're involved in. And it's kind of cool because everyone in the community can kind of share the same way that I'm sharing in on this because we've all kind of made a contribution. Like your code is helping everyone on this call be successful with Dapper and everyone who's going to adopt Dapper in the future be successful with it. Uh, I know I had a blast writing a component for it. It sounds like other of you have written components for it as well. And it's kind of like that kind of sense of pride to know that when Dapper ships, you're shipping with it and you help it make success, make it successful. And that's why we wanted to have DapperCon. This was really an opportunity for the community to kind of come together and say, in our way of saying, thank you so much for all that you've done for Dapper. And hopefully DapperCon 2 is going to be talking about some really cool, crazy stuff that we've added since we spoke to you this time. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I want to say a big, huge thank you to the panelists for joining us today. I know it's crazy times where uh, many of us are because this is a, a global community. But I want to thank you uh, sincerely for joining us today. Thanks, Donovan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.
Thank you so much for joining us in this session. I have Ciprian from Legintech, I believe I'm saying that correctly. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about how they're using Dapper today in their applications. Ciprian, can you give me a quick introduction of who you are so that everyone knows who you are and what your company does? Yeah, hi everybody. So I'm, I'm Ciprian, as you already mentioned, and you are correct, it's called the Legintech Perfect. company. Uh, yeah, we are located in, uh, in Norway and um, we are a company that gathers data, enriches, structures, it, structures it and uh, provides it as, as help for insurance companies, law, enfor law enforcement uh, um, companies to find fraud online. So to give an example, like stolen cars or uh, stolen um, uh, expensive objects like watches and, uh, and so on. Interesting. So you take data in one side and give us better data out on the other side. Do you, can we look at like what the flow of that data looks like? Yeah, sure. Right. So as I said, we take in uh, unstructured data and pretty much all the time it's uh, raw HTML. And then uh, we have this, we call it a plugin handler, which is kind of like a, like a manager of all the microservices that we have and each microservice we call it a plugin <laughs> because okay. we want we think of it as something that we can uh, take take away or uh, and uh, replace it with something else and so on so as you can see here we we have a bunch of plugins and i call them one two and three because they have to follow a certain path right because for let's let's say plugin two requires a result from plugin one to be able to do its work and um, so here, when the unstructured data comes in to the plugin handler, plugin handler calls plugin one, receives back the, the, the response from the plugin one, sends it back to the plugin two, and so on, going through all the plugins that we're gonna have in the future. And as a result, it builds up this structured document where we have, let's say, uh, the type of the document is a vehicle or it describes a vehicle, it has a model, it has a year, and so on, all kinds of structured data that can be used on later for our clients. Gotcha, so take in raw HTML, give me a nice structured document out the other side that we can use to share, comb, or even query data and, and ask questions about in a much easier way than trying to scrape HTML, right? Yeah, that's true. Awesome, so let's talk about, that's the, that's the logical data flow Let's talk about the actual architecture because that's where we're going to start to see mm -hmm. where where Dapper starts to help uh, with this architecture, correct? Yeah, let's try it out. Yeah, so here, here's a generic overview of the architecture we have. Um, we host everything, pretty much everything in AWS. Okay. And um, you can see here the, this, this, uh, um, the outline, the black outline is where AWS environment is. And within it, we have the Dapper environment. Gotcha. Uh, on top, yeah, on top here, we have the plugin handler, which is kind of the public entrance uh, of, the, of the pipeline, of our data pipeline. Here we here we we, we take in uh, all kind of crawl data to, to to be able to push it within the pipeline, and um, pipe, the plugin handler uh, pushes messages to Rabbit Rabbit in queue, um, publishes messages to be to be more precise. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And for example, here we have a parser that kind of takes in that HTML and does something with it, and then at, and in its own time uh, responds back to the Rabbit in queue, um, which the responses get picked up by plugin handler, and then it's, it um, goes farther and, and it does the, the publishing to the plugin image service. So as you can see here, there's a bit of difference because because uh, the plugin image service uh, it connects to its own S3 bucket, for example, right? So it can it can have uh, access to outside resources of the Dapper Dapper uh, environment, let's say. But this is its own kind of thing that it does, that it knows how to do, and we don't have to worry about that. And so on, it goes to, to the series of plugins, as I've, I've, uh, I've uh, explained uh, a little bit before. And all these plugins that we have, they only know to do one thing, and they know to, to, to accept a request and do a response. And then Dapper kind of uh, helps us to facilitate this, all this communication between uh, the plugin handler, all the plugins, RabbitMQ and so on. Awesome. So looking at this picture, I see that you're using RabbitMQ, but I, I would assume you're only using that in the cloud. What are you using as a developer local on your machine? Are you still using RabbitMQ or are you using Redis or, or something else? 
Yeah, Rabbit, you are right. We, we use Rabbit MQ in our um, production or uh, staging environment. But locally, this would be a bit of an overkill. <laughs> right. So we use we use uh, Redis. Um, so it's it's very. It turns out to be very easy to switch to switch the the pub sub um, between production and uh, dev uh, dev environment. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people. Uh, benefit from when they're using Dapper is that ability to have a really nice, fast onboarding for a developer because I don't need to have RabbitMQ. I don't need to have all this big, heavy, hard to hard to uh, right. provision infrastructure on my development machine. I can simply run a Redis container, develop using PubSub, and then move that code without changing it to any environment that I want and then change that backing service to RabbitMQ or to Service Bus or to whatever else that I want to, and my code stays the same. Yeah, that's true. So speaking of code, what language is this written in? Most of our uh, plugins and plugin handler included uh, are all developed in uh, Python. Python, okay, and what framework are you using? Because I know I'm, I'm not a Python developer, but I know <laughs> there's things like Fast API and there's Flask, and I think there's Django. Like, which one are you using? Well, currently, we're using Fast API. We, okay. we, we before we used to use Flask, but we uh, we found out that Fast API is uh, much better for us. Gotcha. I noticed that Dapper shows up on this screen when you're talking about the pub sub, but I also noticed that you're talking to like S3 storage and Elastic. Are you using Dapper for that communication as well, or are you just taking a hard dependency on the SDK to talk to S3? Yeah, every every plugin that connects to a, to an external service, uh, it connects it in own way. It doesn't doesn't include Dapper, so it will gotcha. use SDK or some other clients that they have. So even if I'm a developer working on my local machine, I'm still connecting to the actual S3 storage in the cloud. Today. Yeah, currently, yeah, currently that's that's our <laughs> setup. Yeah, though, that's interesting because one of the things that I like to explain to people is that Dapper can be used as much or as little as you like. In this scenario that you currently have on the screen, you're just using it for PubSub, and that's perfectly OK. If you already have solutions for those other areas or they're not causing you any pain or friction, then there's no reason to take more than you need. But I like this as a, a great example of incremental adoption of Dapper by just using PubSub. But I would encourage you, however, because <laughs> those other building blocks are awesome, because when I'm looking at this screen and I'm seeing your, your dependency on Amazon's S3, it seems like that could also be a Dapper abstraction there so that when I'm a developer running locally on my machine, instead of me having to provision something in S3 or I'm on a long flight overseas and I can't develop anymore because I don't have that reliable network connection to the cloud, if I already put Dapper, another Dapper component there, I can actually abstract away that communication to storage, and then when I'm developing locally, just be writing to a file store. Yeah, that sounds sounds pretty good. I think we'll have to look at more. <laughs> yeah, because then like you don't have to like log in to use special tools. You don't have to provision it. Even if you wanted to see did the file land the way that I wanted it to, you kind of have to remote in and use cloud and use the network. But you can just look at a folder on your hard drive and say, yep, there are all the images that I expected to be downloaded, and I can see that they were downloaded correctly. So even after this is over, I'd love to sit with you and talk about other places where we might be able to incrementally adopt additional parts of of um, of Dapper as well, because that level of abstraction that we provide, it's more than just having the freedom to change in production what your back end is like. It gives the developer a level of abstraction that makes their F5 experience very fast and, uh, and proficient. But again, this is a fantastic example of one, Dapper being agnostic to the cloud, because you're not using Azure, you're not using GCP, you are solely running in AWS, which is great. You're using Python with Fast API, which shows that Dapper can be used by any language. It doesn't matter uh, what language you use. And what I think is also interesting is that Dapper works with languages that haven't even been invented yet. Right? As long <laughs> as you can do an HTTP or a gRPC request, you can actually do all the cool stuff that you're doing as well. So we've talked, we've seen the, we've seen the architecture. We've talked about some of the things you might be able to do in the future. What I'd like to do now, if you don't mind, is can we actually see it, see the code run so we can figure out how Dapper played into your development? Yeah, I'm gonna gonna try to, to share my screen and cool. a short, short demo here for you.
Okay, so um, as I said, we have um, we have a bunch of I'm gonna have a bunch of uh, plugins and the plugin handler running, um, and uh, also obviously we have to kind of uh, connect those applications that are running with Dapper. So I already have um, the um, the plugin handler uh, running, and I have uh, one of the plugins uh, the, which we call a S3 snapshot, which just takes a snapshot of the of the application and uh, saves it, not the application, sorry, the document. Okay. <laughs> saves it in the S3. Um, and then I have one more that I'm gonna just start right now, uh, which which um, which does the, um, yeah, actually the, I'm gonna start the S3, yeah, not the, and the image service is the one that downloads the images. Gotcha. So as soon as I run this command, um, because I have this plugin already running, it's gonna try to, to subscribe to, to, to my application. Got it. So, okay. wait, so this would be really clear with, so that we make sure everyone follows what's going on is that yeah. you have all your services already loaded up in your IDE of choice. They're yes. already running in debug mode. And yes. what you're doing in that terminal is you're basically issuing a dapper run command saying, hey, that app that I want you to talk to is listening for your instructions on port 3700. Yeah. And then when you fire that up, then you're going to be able to have a great debug experience because all your breakpoints are going to get hit, but you're actually running it inside the environment that dapper provides with that sidecar. Yeah, this is this is just one way I find it very useful for myself to 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 do debugging of cool. this ensemble of plugins all at once in a way. <laughs> Got it. No, that's perfect. So if yeah, if I run this, oh, sorry, let me try again. Yes. Okay. So this go. is the the image service that. Um, so currently, it's it's trying to the Dapper is trying to sub subscribe to my to my uh, plugin. So um, and this is just again just a, just a get request. And uh, w when it's trying to subscribe, it's going to return with the with the um, all the pub sub. Um, uh, let's look here. Uh, the pub sub name, the funnel, the the topic, which is um, the the the, um, the topic of the current um, plugin. Um, so this is kind of how, as I said, this is how the application, the Dapper connects to my application. Right. That's so when you issued that Dapper run command, I noticed that you had an app port. And that's, yes. this is when you were saying, hey, Dapper, when you want to call me and talk to me, like this is the port that I'm listening on. And one of the first things that it's done is it said, do you want to subscribe to any pub sub events? And this is you responding to that saying, yes, I do. Yep. And this is the topic I want to listen to. This is the pub sub component oh, I'm registering with. And this is the route that I want you to call me back on whenever yes. something shows up in that pub sub component. Yep. Got it. You're so much better at, uh, at explaining. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just making sure that everyone that <laughs> I'm following along and everyone <laughs> <I'm> following along. <laughs> yeah. All right. So as, as soon as I continue, I can go back to, um, to, to my to my terminal and see that uh, Dapper has been uh, kind of connected to it, and I can look in the logs and see that it listens to this uh, topic and so on. So I can kind of perfect understand that my application is actually working. Right. So I have I actually have um, another application that will try to push some messages to, to all this pipeline, and um, I'm gonna try to hit a few breakpoints to okay. see how every kind of how the plugin handler. Uh, communicates with the each plugin and gets a response from each plugin and so on. Perfect. So let me let me try this out here. So this is just a sample document that you use to test that your code is working. Yes, right? that's and we're correct. just pushing that. Oh, got it. And we're just pushing that onto the pipeline. That's correct. Yeah. So this is a plugin handler, and uh, this Great. is our uh, public um, endpoint that uh, receives all the messages. So as soon as I'm sending a message, uh, the public handler receives it, does whatever it has to do with it, and uh, it's gonna try to push it forward to the first plugin. So if I'm gonna, so this is a breakpoint just before it does the request uh, to push the messages to the to the pub sub. So if you can see here, this is the my my local host which Dapper okay. runs on, and I do a publish, and this is the name of the plugin. Which is which is the the topic of that plugin? 
Got it. Yeah, because if we could, if we break down that that URL that you're showing there, yeah. that port forty one eighty eight 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 five was provided for you as an environment variable. It's like when you do the dapper run command, it sets up these environment variables so that your code is also not hard coded. Your code is able to be very dynamic because the port that dapper is running on might change, and yeah. dapper is able to say, hey, when you need to talk to me, like this is the port, and it's saying, hey, dapper, I need you to publish onto the funnel dev pub sub component to this topic. Right, and then you're just giving it the data that you want it to actually publish there, right? Yes. So this is the yeah, the payload here. Perfect. So, uh, and when I when I publish this, I expect I expect to 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 receive a message on the plugin um, image service uh, okay. plugin, just as it says here. And let's see if uh... yes. Yeah, so here um, here is the the image service plugin, and um, here is when it receives the request. So, like we can see here in the request that it has all kinds of uh, all kinds of data that comes uh, comes from. Um, let me just try to make this. And um, let's look here. Maybe it'll be better. I noticed some interesting information. Like I even see like your tracing context and. Oh well, yeah, stuff yeah, like that's that. <laughs> that's something that uh, it's also we we set up to to do a bit of tracing in. Um, in the, using Dapper as well, using the, the tracing uh, from Dapper. So maybe I can just run you through this a little bit uh, sure. and find out. So um, as we kind of discovered that um, Dapper appends a tracing header for every request that goes through. So we can see it here, um, this this trace parent. Gotcha. And, uh, so we, we, we extract this trace parent and we kind of push it forward through every plugin to be able to kind of connect them and see a whole, uh, so how the document goes, our document goes through each plugin separately and kind of follow a, follow a, a trace. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So I, I like the fact, because a, a lot of people might not know this, that you're taking advantage of the observability feature of Dapper that you just get by using Dapper, right? There's, there's nothing you have to do, but where you're doing by actually taking that parent trace and propagating it along is you're helping Dapper realize that all these calls are related to one document. Exactly. Right. Otherwise, yeah. you would just get all these entries, which are still valuable because you know like when they happened, how long they happened. Yeah. But now you're going to be able to see that when this first document entered, I can actually walk that same document through the entire path of my code by simply adding basically one or two lines of code yeah. uh, here to propagate that. Very cool. Yeah. So and here is here's the payload that comes from the from from our plugin handler. And this is this is kind of some of the some of the the, the the item itself which which for us is a document and from, from from now on we're gonna let this plugin do its job okay and uh, and then we have this function called doer which does does a job whatever you have to do it's not important for us anymore uh, and then at some point oh, yeah at, at at this point is it's done its job and it has to go back and respond with the, with the result got to the plugin handler, which will okay. collect all those results and build up our structured document. And this is ju just before doing the doing the, the request to plugin handler. So gotcha. you can see same same uh, pops up. It's just a different topic, which, which right. is the topic of the plugin handler that the plugin handler is listening to. Perfect. And then as I continue, uh, we see that we're back to the plugin handler. Yep, and, and this is the other end point, which is not public anymore. Of the, the plugin handler that receives all the responses. Gotcha. Uh, so every... this is the plugin handler also registered or subscribed to different topics inside of RabbitMQ, yeah. which the plugins are able to use to communicate back and forth with the plugin handler. Yes. Got it. Um, and this is this is the second. So uh, once the plugin handler receives the response from the first plugin, it appends it to the to the document and invokes what is uh, not invokes, but tries to publish the document to the next plugin. So right. in this case, we call it the S3 snapshot plugin. Gotcha. And now is the same again. It receives back the response from the from the S3 S3 snapshot plugin, and it's gonna append it to the document. Gotcha. Yeah, and this is kind of a quick, a quick overview of how how we run how we run things. And what I like about this is that you're having a really good 
like debug experience, right? You're just yeah. you're setting breakpoints. You're able to hit them. You're able to jump from one microservice to the other microservice and kind of see how their communication works. And I think that's one of the things that I like the best. And I've noticed that when I'm looking at your code, I'm not seeing a lot of heavy heavy lifting or a lot of code to parse data. Uh, all this data just comes to you in the format that you're able to use immediately uh, in all of your 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 routes, right? All of the methods that you've written have, have your routes. So I think again is some of the great stuff about uh, using Dapper is that with something as little as an attribute, you can subscribe and and deal with the data that you're working with. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I'd like to talk about because we we talked a little bit about propagating that that trace parent. Do you have Zipkin running to where we could see what the Zipkin dashboard looks like? Yes, I do, but uh, there'll be a little bit of um, yeah. Let me let me try it out and see how it sure. works. We're still in the in the development phase, so some things work, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> don't fully work. But because we've seen, I think some of the messages that I've been working on they kind of uh, um, timed out. Okay. Uh, so um, we might see we might see a structure that's not fully correct, but okay. I can. Uh, yeah, I think I have to. I'm gonna have to run again through the whole pipeline just to create a better. Uh, yeah, I guess without your breakpoints too, right? Because yes. it looks like what's happening is that it was retrying because it was saying, "Hey, this is taking too long." Yes. But I think what's really interesting is that being able to see that even in Zipkin, that like I timed out and I had to try again, is still really valuable information because if you don't see that, it might be an indication that your retry logic isn't working <laughs> like the way it's yeah. supposed to be working. Right? Things are just timing out and not having. The right effect, which is interesting too. Yeah. So now you're just going through and you're clearing all your breakpoints so that you can try to run one more through there. Yes. Yes. So I just run another message that's uh, a bit quicker. <laughs> yeah. There's one with eight. So I think it's the second one. Yeah. The yeah, there's the one. Last one. Yeah, yeah. The last one is the one I want. Yeah. Awesome. So now, now as as we run faster to the without having to discuss every step of the <laughs> we actually had a, a nicer flow so here you can see that you know we just see the plugin handler the public endpoint receive the message invokes the image service and then we, we call this the controller the plugin handler which is puts all those result uh, responses from the plugin together so this controller is going to be called every time uh, any of the plugins run just to append the result together Gotcha. Then this, uh, then the S3 snapshot follows, and finally again the plugin handler, the controller. I so, yeah, yeah. So the, the the plugin handler and the controller seem to orchestrate who gets the next message and exactly, what. Yeah. You know, got got it. And then mm -hmm. what's really cool here is is being able to visualize exactly how your document, where your document entered, yeah, which which services it went to in which order it went to those particular services. And you also get to see things like duration. So you'll be able to yes. determine if one of your services is much slower or the bottleneck of your process too. Yeah, and this kind of makes uh, very much sense because the image service it actually downloads the images. So that kind of naturally will take uh, a bit more time. It has to connect to other services and so on. Gotcha. This is uh, very, very useful. We've, I've, I've found a few of the, the um, difficulties with my application just looking at this kind of understanding easier how the flow goes gotcha and this is Zipkin. so being able to see the way that the messages are being processed has given you ideas where you might be able to optimize right yeah. like do i really need both of these two involved in the orchestration of the movement maybe you can actually uh, make your code more efficient thanks to being able to see it because had you not been able to see this like we're we're in our minds, we're trying to think. Like, I think I know what it's doing, and uh, those breakpoints make sense. But there might have been pieces of code that you didn't set a breakpoint in that aren't getting hit that you're not even realizing are being part of this loop. But when you yeah. see it on the screen, you're like, "Oh my gosh, I didn't even think <laughs> that I was calling back into this particular service." Let me go see why I'm doing that, and maybe make this a place where I can be more efficient by eliminating a, a hop through processing the document. Yeah, no, actually, here I have a, I have an example that exactly what you're talking about. This plugin handler, the public uh, endpoint, technically it shouldn't. I, we'll have to figure it out yet, but it shouldn't be called. Um, but only the controller, the controller part. Gotcha. Because because it has, it should be only the entrance point of the whole pipeline. Gotcha. But I think we have we probably have some some, uh, some inconsistency there that it's being called some does some extra calls, although they are super small. They still 
extra. <laughs> no, for sure. There's a, there's a hops on the network, potential uh, areas where something could fail that doesn't yeah. need to fail. Doesn't and fail. also it's just going to put more taxing on that particular handler, especially again, I, I think that this is so valuable. A lot of people don't think that observability is, is that important, but this is a great example of where just seeing it visually has already said that look right like that's not what i expected to happen and one of two things i need to go better understand the flow of our data or realize that that's redundant and we can now be far more efficient because you might end up if you're in a big heavy traffic scenario having to scale out your plugin handler simply because you're calling it too often not because you actually needed that additional scale right mm -hmm. what you needed the bigger scale on is one of these other microservices but now we're scaling out several of them because you're calling one of them potentially for for reasons you don't need, which is fantastic. So yeah. again, it's really cool to be able to see how you get this for free, but with just a couple of lines of code that you added just to propagate along that parent trace header so that Dapper is able to say, oh, okay, I see these things are related. Another thing that people might not know about the tracing, which is really cool, is you're using Zipkin now, but just like every other component we have in, in Dapper, you could replace this with something else. You could replace this with whatever tracing tool or observability tool you like. For example, I'm obviously a fan of Azure. So uh, <laughs> Application Insights, I could actually have this same visualization inside Application Insights inside of Zipkin, but on-prem, again, using Zipkin that runs inside of a Docker container that's automatically installed when I do a dapper init. So when you did a dapper init, you got Redis for free, you got sure. Zipkin for free, and you got all this functionality in this great dev environment with, with no modifications whatsoever. And then you go in and you change your configurations. Speaking of configurations, could you quickly find like the actual pub sub configurations? Do you have one of those handy? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, yes, yeah, so right here in our development uh, deploy folder, we have the Dapper configurations for our um, Staging environment, and cool. uh, here, here we have the the, the um, pub sub uh, component that, yeah. we, that we configure to be deployed on the staging environment. Okay, and uh, and we have quite similar uh, thing, but similar but different <laughs> <laughs> for the for the local for the local uh, local deploy um, environment, which is uh, which is um, the same uh, pub sub, but it's Redis in, in this in this situation. So it's much much less to to correct uh, put together yeah yep yep as long as that the type there on line looks like line six on the right hand side and line what is that line eight on the left hand side that's actually making it different it's just saying hey yep. i'm redis now but i want to be rabbit mq in the future and this is the only thing that changes and you can change this in your ci cd pipeline like this isn't something that a developer has to worry about because the code doesn't know if it's Redis or RabbitMQ, nor does it care, because all I had to do as a developer is write that post method, which we just saw in your code, and it will receive the proper message in the proper format, no matter what the backing service is, which again, is just uh, very cool. So just give me really quick, what are your, like, your just your general impressions on Dapper and some of the things you think you might do with Dapper going forward? I think we are, um, we are interested in the in the observer uh, furthermore in, in the observability part. I think we'd like to, as you, as you mentioned, uh, maybe because we're already extracting a lot of logs and uh, pushing them to Elasticsearch, or uh, okay. so, and we'll be interested to see if we can do the same. Kind of have one unified place for met, uh, traces and logs. Also, we're quite interested in the the binding um, part of the part of the uh, the dapper. Because uh, as you mentioned, like we'll see with the with the S3 if we can do something, some you know, change things around a little bit, and instead of making direct uh, sure. connection, do a, like a binding maybe, or uh, yeah, yeah. So I I I uh, I'd be more than happy. Like we should set up a meeting just the two of us because I think there's some cool places where we could go and leverage Dapper. Because I really think that S3 giving your developers a really cool like F5 experience to where they're just looking at a local file share. On their on their actual machine, a folder would be a lot more convenient uh, than having to connect to a cloud resource just to do local development. And again, the code won't have to change, which is would be really interesting. So this has been an awesome tour, and again, it highlighted a lot of things that I think people need to understand about Dapper is that you can use it on any cloud. 
and, and you're using it on AWS. You can use it with any language and, and you're using it with Python. And it just gives you this great F5 experience because of those levels of abstraction. And finally, you can use as little of it as you want. Uh, in this example here, you're currently using the PubSub and you're using observability and you've already identified places where you might be able to go ahead and add additional functionality. So Ciprian, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for hanging out with us and sharing with us what uh, you're doing with Dapper. The pleasure was all mine. Awesome. Thank you all for spending the day with us. We hope you enjoyed day one of DapperCon as much as we did. Be sure and join us tomorrow for day two, where you can participate in a workshop and get hands on with Dapper. If you plan to code along, be sure and install Git, Visual Studio Code, Docker, the Dapper CLI, and initialize Dapper locally. If you are a C Sharp developer, make sure you have the .NET 5 SDK, the C Sharp extension installed in Visual Studio Code, and PowerShell. For Java developers, you will need Java 16 or later and Maven 3.8.2 or later. And for Python developers, you will need Python 3.9 or later and the Python extension for Visual Studio Code installed. For more details, visit the Dapper blog. Have a great rest of your day and see everyone tomorrow.